got Sagari working this show on Streamlabs OBS. So press go live now on OBS itself. It says it's live. I'm seeing a green box. Oh, um, oh, I see is movement it, on the is screen. It, is, it, is, it, is it good? No, I don't think so. Oh my god, it's like the world was against me. My god. So, <laughs> in all of the times I've streamed, I've never run into an issue with the MVEC encoder. And then it tells me to update my graphics driver. I do that, yeah, blue screen of death. I then come back in and, uh, yeah, um, having well issues. 20 minutes late. Twenty? No, wait, 30 minutes late. I apologise. It's like, unfortunately, the delay of Jag Extremes have followed me in some way, shape, or form. Um... I think I, I've had to botch a layout really quickly on OBS, even it's the same layout I use on Streamlabs, but whatever. Um, we're here. We're live. I apologize for <laughs> massive delay and all the same, but without further ado, I have the absolute pleasure to introduce to my left, Mackay. How you doing, sir? Hello. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. We sat here for half hour. <laughs> on the guitar, entertaining you. Oh, yeah. We Stop got, you pulling your we, hair we, out. We kind of have the same door. I didn't even... Ah. How about that? <laughs> Sorry, it's all... To be fair, you know, doors in the UK are pretty standard. Yeah, they, they are a bit. They're a little bit standard. Um... I used to work for um, a home base years ago. And uh, so I know all about doors and the different sizes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a very boring story that was all i had sorry <laughs> so if you uh, are not familiar with these type of streams i do i've kind of been doing them now for three weeks properly um what i love to do is get people who either have worked at jagex or um currently work at jagex and get them to talk to us about their story um how they got to the industry how they got to jagex and everything else but um obviously with matt k comes a very um a significant element to the stream because of course matt was around during the original um, launch of Old School RuneScape back in, what, 2013? Is that correct? Or 2012? 2013. Okay. Yes. So, you know, we have a lot to talk about, but I mean, without further ado, obviously you mentioned home base. Matt, um, talk to me about life before Jagex. What did you do? Oh, blimey. All right. So, um, uh, I worked my first, uh, my first real job was actually worked for my next door neighbours when I was 12. Uh, in their garden centre, sweeping up. That was a pound an hour. Wow. Um, <laughs> all right, all right, pound an hour. I used to buy a can of Coke and uh, and 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 watch the football on Saturday afternoon, which used to be on normal TV back then. In fact, there were TVs back then before anyone was quite surprised <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it used to be on free-to-air TV on BBC and ITV, right? Uh, just BBC. Oh, no, just BBC, get, you're um, right, yeah, sorry. You get Grandstand, which... Uh, I, I, not a huge amount of people remember, I would imagine. <laughs> I love the themes on the grandstand. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I did that. And then I, uh, when I was 16, I got a part-time job at Waterstones, which is a book chain. And uh, I, worked, I worked through there until I was for about nine years. Oh, wow. Okay. And went through, started off just uh, selling books at the weekend, and then ended up managing a store um, over in Kettering, uh, which is not the best place in the world to ever visit. There's not a lot there. Wicksteed Park, which is quite nice, worthwhile taking the mini Shawnee to at some point when she gets older. No, it. Um, uh, but that's, that's about it. Um, so I did that, and then I left and uh, joined Home Base and designed kitchens for a bit. Um, oh, and I was in somewhere in there. There's a great three months where I worked for a musical instrument shop, and every lunchtime the manager used to bring in a bottle of wine, and we just all get absolutely blottoed all afternoon. And um, the shop went bust after three months, but it was a great three months. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should mention you will occasionally hear my uh, at Facebook, and that's just my wife. I'm just talking to my wife while she's at work, trying to keep her company. So you will occasionally hear little blips. So sorry for the confusion uh, there. So three months music job closed down. Yeah, three months closed down, um, and then then I joined uh, Home Base. And after that, what did I do after that? Um, oh, importing forklift trucks from China. So from designing kitchens to uh, importing forklift trucks from China, which was a bit of a different job. Uh, that was quite fun. Um, got to drive around some big forklift trucks. And then um, it was about, it was just before I started that job that uh, my wife turned to me and said, Matt, Matt, I found this great game you should play called RuneScape. This was back in May 2004. And uh, I was like, okay, I better do what the wife says because uh, as you'll know, you don't have a choice in these matters. Um, so I uh, started, started working with, I uh, started playing uh, RuneScape and uh, then about October time, I uh, became a PMOD. 
to one of the first P mods uh, that, that that was around. Can you remember who messaged you? Oh, it was. Oh, damn! What was her name? No, That's gone. Okay. Completely gone. Before I'd ask, just Emma. in case. Mod Emma V. Mod Emma, Emma v. v. Okay. Emma V. So Emma Vicenzi or something. Um, married now, so she hasn't got that name. Um, so yeah, so I uh, became a P mod. Then um, uh, in October the next year, my wife saw a job in the local newspaper, or rather, sort of you know, in the summer, local newspaper to go work for player support. So my wife applied for the job. Uh, she went there, had an interview, and uh, had a trial, and didn't get the job. And then when she came back, she told me I had to go and apply for the job. So I, I went and applied for the job, and uh, I got the job, and uh, started off in, in player support. That Ev was my journey. Everyone into seemed to start like everyone's going to get into it. Yeah. Uh, was, uh... Maz just said Mod MV was on trial the same time as me, and we all got the job in support. Yes, because there was you, there was Emma, and there was... Who was the third one? There was another female, wasn't there? I'm sure Maz will build her. Yeah, I'm sure Maz, because um, she went off and became an artist. The, in fact, I think both of them... That was it, Laura, that's right. Um, I think both of them went off to become artists. And uh, one of them, if I remember rightly, married... I, th I think they both, Emma and um, Laura, married people from Jagex. Okay. Possibly. <laughs> this is a long time ago. I think they did. If not, they, they had relationships with people from Jagex, but you know, there you go. Okay. Um anyway. Yeah, so there you go. That was my that was my intro into the gaming industry, completely forced by my wife. No, no intention of me ever wanting to do anything in the gaming industry and uh can you remember how, and never left. Can you remember how the interview went? Oh god, yeah. Um, so I turned up for the interview about twenty minutes early. I was alright, I'll sit outside the front of my car and wait. And uh, about five minutes before, because you can't turn up too early for an interview, you can't turn up too late. Um, I went to uh, went to press the buzzer, and as I went to do that, a load of people started walking in the office. One of them turned to me, who uh, uh, his name was Ben Southall or Southworth, I think, can't remember. Um, he said, "Oh, what are you here for?" I said, like, "I'm here for an interview." He's like, "Okay, let me in." And he let, he let me in and uh, sat me down in the foyer and said, "All right, I'll let them know you're here, and somebody will be down in a minute." And I waited for an entire hour, and nobody turned up. <laughs> I was ready just to walk out the door and go, well, this is a bloody waste of time, and <laughs> go home. And then the person who came in for the next interview turned up. Uh, does somebody let her in through the door? I was like, excuse me, but I've been waiting here for an hour. Somebody said they'd go and tell somebody. <laughs> so I had an interview with um, <laughs> the Italian guy. What was his name, Maz? The Italian guy, Francesco? Um, and he had the thickest Italian accent you've ever heard. I couldn't understand a word he said. So I just smiled and <laughs> nodded and... <laughs> I just tried to talk a bit about myself and not, not knowing what <laughs> that I asked. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I got the job. So there you go. <laughs> Must have done something, right? <laughs> so yeah, my interview was a complete car crash, but maybe that's why I got the job. I don't know. <laughs> so so did, you didn't move, presumably, you just drove in to work every day? Yes, it yeah. Move. So I was living in a place called Yaxley at the time, which is a little village outside uh, Peterborough. Was I in Yaxley? I think I was in Yaxley. Yes, I was in Yaxley back then. So yeah. So I uh, just basically down the A14 every day for eight years. Bloody hell! That was, yeah, that was that was that was great fun. So you come into Jagex, you've joined uh, into player support. So is there yeah. anything right off the bat um, in your time in player support that comes to mind? Ooh, blimey! Um, so there was one story. One thing we used to do in player support was um, uh, do. Um, uh, uh, snapshots. So these were basically when somebody reports somebody, you'd get a text file of what came through. You'd go through, you'd read it, and then you apply offences based on what was being said. Uh, we used to look at every single one. They all used to be uh, it all used to be dealt with. And uh, there was a habit of people um, saying funny lines out loud. And there's one moment that sticks in my mind where the office is absolutely quiet, and all you can hear is you know the keyboards. And, uh, and then just somebody goes, oh, my God, I've come over my keyboard. That's <laughs> <laughs> it out of slide across the entire office. <laughs> so, yes, that was that was a uh, quite hilarious moment. What? Oh, my yeah. God. So after the stuff that RuneScape players used to write. <laughs> wow. wow. So how long were you in place above for? 
uh, about three months, and then I moved into um, uh, community management. About three months in. So, what was the community management team like back then? Oh, blimey! So we had how do I remember about eight or ten of us? I think uh, it must have started about six, then it grew to about ten to fifteen. Oh, yeah, it's probably about six it started with, and then it grew quickly to about eight to ten. I can't exactly remember, but um, there was an F mod team and a P mod team. That was basically community management. There's nothing beyond that. Um, uh, the three people on the F mod team, three people on the P mod team. The F mods, I got. I went onto the P mod team because I used to be a P mod, so uh, um, that made sense. Uh, you basically talk to P mods. Um, all day answer their snapshots before anyone else's. So because obviously they were they were a better quality of snapshot. So you'd answer those. You then uh, reply to them all on the uh, forums, um, and uh, then you used to uh, review their snapshots as well over time to so give feedback to the individual P mods. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much what it was. The forum mods used to do exactly the same, but with the forum mods. So um, obviously coming to community management uh, and obviously back then, of course, it was very, as you mentioned, it wasn't v visible in that regard. It was quite guarded. Uh, obviously, you compare mm. that to nowadays, like, you know, the streets yeah. and everything else. So there used to be, you used to have one hour a month you were allowed to go and game on your JMOD. One hour a month? Out. One hour a month, yeah. Wow. Um, and it was held up as, you know, you've done, worked well, so you now get an hour to go and game and talk to people on your JMOD. And wow. it was all monitored and... Uh, and uh, you'd have um, uh, you'd have a, a schedule of when people were going in and where they had to go, you know, what worlds and what area you had to stand in and talk to people. And, uh, yeah, so it was very different back then. Um, it was very much uh, focused on delivering, uh, producing something when what you should have been doing as community management, which you all know is you should be listening, you shouldn't actually be doing. Much more emphasis needs to go on the listening to people to understand what's going on rather than just going out and just producing stuff because then you just don't have the time to read, listen, or understand. Um, so, yeah, it's very different back then. But it used to be incredibly tense. I remember the first time I went in-game on my J-Mod. I was sweating. You know, you're like, oh, I've got to say the right thing. And the first time, it's even the same as a bit of P-Mods out there as well. The same first time you uh, speak as a P-Mod, it's an incredibly stressful time because you've got this crown that's suddenly going to appear, and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how you can react to it. And it's like, uh, it was a very, very tense time. Um it's like second nature now, so it's not, not so, great drama. Someone said, uh, they haven't specified when this was, but someone said, I remember Matt running around the wildy tanking all the teams in full bronze. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't have been back then. Oh, <laughs> <we're allowed. laughs> so so let's, let's go forward sort of like um, uh, eight years to the launch of old school. There's uh, me, Ash, and um, uh, Dan and Nexus at the time. We decided that, that because no one was really paying attention to us, because everybody thought that old school was going to fail, we were just left to get on and do what we wanted to. So uh, we made this uh, this sort of decision where at Jagex at the time, the way you communicated was you said nothing unless you absolutely knew you could say it. And because nobody was paying any attention to us, like we're going to turn that on its head and let's just say everything unless we absolutely know we can't say it and just see how that works. And uh, there's all these rules of what you could do with your J mod, and I was like, I'm just going to go and break every single one of them and see what happens. And one of them was you couldn't go into the wilderness. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> so I went into the wilderness and, uh, and I did multiple events there with, with a big disclaimer saying, I'm going to kill you if you come into the wilderness with me. <laughs> and we made these special tools for me to allow me to kill people much quicker and to tank damage as well. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> you know, people loved it. <laughs> Wow. Okay, so yeah. obviously, you know, you mentioned at the start of old school. We, are, I imagine, we have a lot to talk about with that. So just going back quickly. So you're in community management for how long? It, was it eight years or? Oh, God, it must have been. I swear, it was 2005 to about 2014 was when I officially moved to product management. But um, yeah. So however long that is, five to fourteen, nine years. Anything in nine years that comes to mind. Before we get into old school. Oh, no, nothing at all. It's boring. <laughs> high, high level forums? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. So, um, right, okay, what happened in nine years? Um, so, yeah, high level forums and the clan leader forum, they were two really exciting times because that was when we had a new head of community come in, a guy called Martin. Uh, real clever guy, far too maverick for Jagex at the time. He wanted to do all this really cool stuff. But at the time, um, Jagex wasn't ready to do all this really cool stuff. It's all stuff we've done since. So it was the right thing to do, and he was ahead of the curve in doing it. And um, 
it was uh, it was yeah it was uh, those are the two things that came out and stuck so the high level forums um the whole idea was just somewhere to make the high level players feel a bit valuable get a bit of feedback from them if we wanted to uh nothing more than that and it very quickly turned into um i want to become a high level player to get into these forums and it started off with what 347 people in it i think was the first first lot so there only you know you had to be maxed to get into it um so it started with 347 people and the most um, the fascinating thing about it was an ever used to add somebody you used to add them in batches so you'd go out you'd find all the people that recently maxed you then add them all into the, into the uh, forums it was a manual process so you had to put people into spreadsheets sort spreadsheets get the names and then manually add them using i mean you've used the interface i'm My sure the, uh, God. the old it's, it's, forums it's, back-end it's, interface was so, the most horrific thing in the it's, world it's still, it still is unfortunately like um when you have to add people to the premier club forums you have to like so if thousands of thousands of people who buy Premier Club forums, you have to batch them, spreadsheet them, and make specific links for them and try and run them. It's, it's, it's horrendous. Absolutely yeah. horrendous. Not a fan. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. so it's, it's pretty terrible. <laughs> but, but back then, it wasn't so many because you probably have, what, three or four a week. So it, was, it wasn't so much of a problem. It's just identifying and making sure you haven't missed anybody. Um, and you add them into the forums. I've completely forgotten where I was going with this. Yeah, so you'd add people in, and out of one batch that you put in, You'd always get somebody who thought they were better than everyone else because everybody that they'd, they'd, they'd been in contact with in game wasn't maxed and they were just about to get there, so they thought they were the best thing in sliced bread. So you'd, they'd always go in there and, uh, and start shooting their mouth off about how they're better than everyone else, and everyone was like, "No, we're all maxed too, mate. Come on." And you'd always have that that conversation that happened on a weekly basis with a new, at least one new person that came in. That was always quite fun. It just got quite regular until it became a joke, and it was. Uh, it was, it was quite funny. One brilliant thing about the um, uh, the, the high level forums was um, there was a bit of a rebellion one day. Something I don't even know what it was, but something had upset them that something wasn't happening. And uh, somebody posted on the forum. They said, "You don't care about us. You don't do this. You don't listen to us. You don't care about us. You don't, we get nothing. It's it's what we've been dedicated ourselves to this game for years and years and years. And you, you know, we spent so much money on it, and you don't do anything for us." And everyone's like, "Yeah, yeah, this isn't fair. This isn't right." I was like, come on, guys, who else knows that who are, what other games company do you get personal access to somebody who works there, that you get a forum where you can discuss things with people, you get events put on just for you, um, and you get the, the best information first. What other games company does that? And they were like, oh, yeah, sorry, Matt. <laughs> Apologized and <laughs> went off. I was like, that's brilliant. Okay, so um, you mentioned, so that's a, that's a backlash you dealt with back then. Argued, arguably, would you say dealing with backlash back then was much more easier compared to, let's say, the backlash of whatever happened in 2018, 2019, so on and so forth? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, uh, the internet's different, that's why. Social media was no... I mean, back in 2000, the, uh, before 2010, social media was nowhere near as prevalent as it is now. And, uh, yeah, everything happened on our forums, everything happened control, and it was, it was, it was pretty straightforward and simple. And um, we just had to keep giving out the same message. The biggest difference, I think from an individual dealing with it is back in the 2000s i wasn't the one who could do anything about what you were talking about so when you had big issues that hit such as uh taking away the wilderness and all that sort of stuff um there was nothing i could do about it i just had to toe the line and keep the keep the story going because that's all i could do uh when when i started running uh, old school then it was different you know if there was a problem then a lot of it was about swallowing pride and going okay how do we solve this rather than um Rather than just towing a line, which was which 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 was more difficult but a lot, lot more effective um, to deal with stuff. Okay, so we run up to old school 2013. Oh, we've got, we've got oh. things before. Old school, oh, yeah. go on, go on. Um, what have we got? Um, six 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 Falador massacre. Yes. So I was there on that night. That was quite entertaining because we had. Um, it was about it was one o'clock in the morning, I think it was, and our shift finished at two a.m. And uh, so we're sitting there, then we hear these reports come through saying someone is 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 killing people. And it's like, no, no, it can't be happening. Come on, it can't be happening. So we ignore it, and a few more reports come through. And it's like, oh, we probably ought to have a look at this. And uh, we log into Gabe to see, you know, uh, 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 what's his face running around uh, killing lots of people? Cheerio. Cheerio. Yeah. And uh, and I I spoke with him actually about six months ago, so I'll tell you about that in a minute as well. Oh. Um, uh, and... Um, yeah, so I was, I was, 
I was, we sat there and I was like, oh, what, what on earth do we do? Uh, so you phone the escalation process and you phone a developer, which turned out to be Ash, uh, to say, uh, oh, we need someone to come in and fix this because it's a bit broken. Uh, you know it's going to be half hour, hour before anybody turns up because they've got to wake up and get dressed and do, do all the stuff before actually turning up and, and doing something because there's no out of office work at that point. You had to come into the office. Um, and we, um, so I was like, right, okay, let's ban the people responsible. So we're getting all these reports come in. So we ban uh, Juriel, obviously, um, because he's the one doing all the killing. Uh, and then we found out that it was a guy called uh, Cursed You, who I also spoke to recently, which is quite interesting. Um, uh, Cursed You, who uh, was the player that instigated the, the bug that did it. Because he and, held the party, uh, didn't he? The 99 construction yes, party. Yes, he yep. held the party. He, he allowed people to, to enable... He enabled the bugs so people were going to kill each other. Um, and he was a notorious um, bug abuser and, uh, and real world trader as well. Uh, but for some reason, it took about 12 months to actually ban him. So we banned him on the night and said, right, okay, that's it, problem solved. Uh, and then he got unbanned the next day by Andrew. What? Well, on the, on the, on the, um, uh, on the command of Andrew. Um, I don't think he actually did it himself. He might have done, but, um, but there was a note on there saying, why is this guy banned? There's no evidence to show that he did anything. And we're sitting there going, well, come on. <laughs> it's quite clearly everyone is telling us this. And uh, and so it obviously came a bee in the bonnet for the ICU team back then um, to actually find this guy cheating so they could get rid of him with evidence um, because everybody knew what he'd been doing. And it took about 12 months to get enough evidence to stop him stop him being uh, being banned. And uh, I, like I said, I was chatting to him. Yeah, it must have been... It was probably about a year ago now. Uh, he was saying that the money he made from it, he used to put himself through university. <laughs> And my sort of approach, which, you know, my, my approach, he made about 20 grand, I think, from actually all the bug abuse he did. and the Holy stuff like hell. And I uh, used it to put himself through university. And my sort of approach, you know, officially when I worked at Jagex, it was bad, couldn't do it. But my approach has always been personally how I feel about it is, you know, people make huge amount of money by doing this. And as long as I use that money for something positive, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with it. Um, because there's nobody really missing out unless you're sort of stealing other people's accounts and doing that sort of thing, which I think is very wrong. But the actual real-world trading and stuff, and I'm like, it's, it's, as long as that money's being used, I can, I can see a good reason for it. And he used it to go through university, so I was like, you know, fair play, carry on. And uh, on the flip side of that, I don't know if anybody remembers, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, he was responsible for all the DDoSing that happened back in 2013. 14. Um, oh, I'm sure the chat can help us out with that one. Yeah, come on, what was his name? Um, EJM, that was him. Um, and uh, no, this was this was uh, before Savaged. Um, even where Savaged was, was small fish compared to EJM. <laughs> um, and I was chatting to EJM again. It was after I left Jagex uh, when we were talking about it. And uh, he was saying that he made a million pounds from, uh, from, from all the stuff he did, the DDoSing and the real world trading. What? And I said, oh, that's, 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 that's like really well done. But what have you done with the money? He's like, oh, I'm retired now. I'll do nothing. I'm like, come on, that's the laziest thing in the world you could possibly do. You've got this money which can make a massive difference to the world. And you're doing nothing with it. And that's that's a sort of like that. I mean, it, to be fair, he might not have been telling the truth. Um, and he probably inflated the number to make himself look bigger than he was. But the really cool thing about it was, was um, when uh, we knew it was happening, uh, I ran an investigation to find out who the guy was who was doing it. And we had the names of addresses of his family, where he lived and everything else. So afterwards, I was talking to him and saying, oh, yeah, you know, we found all this stuff out about you. We just decided not to take you to court because we solved it in other ways. And to be fair, it takes a lot of money to do that. And, uh, so I told him about it. He's like, oh, my God, you knew exactly who I was. I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> the internet tells us these things. It's not hard to do. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, yeah, so we, we, we were effectively doxing people, but that's... That's what you do. If you want to see somebody, you find the information and you do that. But we solved it. Anyway, anyway, we're jumping way far forward. Mind blown. Um, uh, you mentioned about Juriel. It's been yeah, it's so Juriel. So again, chatting with him, and he said he never regretted it ever, what he did. And I'm like, you know, to be fair, I can understand that. You know, I he's a. Uh, I can imagine it was an adrenaline rush of being able to do you. something that no one else could do and watching the literal panic you're doing. Like, yeah. I can kind of get that. Yeah, he became famous. He started playing again soon afterwards and has played ever since. Um, and he's got accounts that, you know, regularly um, log in. Or well, we did have until, uh, until obviously I don't know about it now. But 
Um, so he always carried on playing a bit. But, you know, to get that fame and always, you know, always be a name for him there. Uh, just like, yeah, don't, don't regret it. Well, that's fair play. <laughs> fair play. I mean, <laughs> well, we're 25 minutes into the stream and we've had stories that I don't think anyone's ever heard before already. Just to give you an idea of what we're expecting during the stream. I'm mind blown already. Um, right. So do we want to jump into old school? Or have you got more stuff to... Um, saddest time, I guess, um, was the death of... Um, old Knight? The old night, yeah. So again, I was working that night when the reports came in. Um, see, I think he was number two at the time. And um, we started getting, the way we found out is we started getting in uh, account recovery requests for his account. And they were really accurate ones. And we were like, hang on, this is this is not right. You know, when you have an accurate um, account recovery thing for somebody in the top two of your, your high scores you're immediately you know your brain's ticking over going this this isn't there's something's odd going on here we need to not allow these and start investigating it and so we did this investigation and um found out that that he died and uh, we ended up having a a map uh on the wall of all all the accounts that were related to him and how how they all folded into his, his uh, immediate family because all his items were going off all over the place as well and so we ended up getting uh, in touch with his wife, or she got in touch with us, uh, to find out what was going on. And uh, basically, he had bequeathed his uh, his items uh, in his will. Wow. And uh, we were like, okay, you know, officially it's against the rules. Um, but, you know, when, when you're thinking about an individual and how they're dealing with their grief, this is, he'd literally just died. Um, and they were, it was the way they were trying to deal with him. Uh, deal with their grief that they were having. So, you know, we let them all the items disappear off and then we sort of uh, locked the account and said, no, we're going to lock it so that no one else can uh, can get their hands on it. And then that's sort of always always going to be safe. So no one's going to have that. And uh, that seemed to that seemed to work quite nicely. Um, but I think it was just part of their grieving process to, to get it done. But that was that was quite a quite a difficult night that was. Um how did you did, like so you mentioned was that how you found out when their wife managed to get directly in contact with you or no, I can't remember how we did it. I, I, th I think we must have messaged her and, and talked to her in game about it. Okay. Um, but that's yeah, that was that was that was, that was a long time ago. That was that, about two thousand six, seven. He died. I mean, yeah, it? I think it was two thousand six, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was sort of the the time where you realised that you know that personal, you have to personally do something um, beyond what the rules say and what the what the structure says. And, you know, to be fair, if the the senior people got upset about it. You wouldn't care that much because, quite frankly, you did the right thing, and nobody argued about it. They were like, "Yeah, that's, that's the right way of dealing with it." Um, wow. So yeah, so that was that. So what else happened in that time? Go on, the, the wilderness going. Mm -hmm. That was. When that was it? Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Yeah. 2009, 2009, yeah. This is going to be a long stream, by the way, everybody. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I don't think people are going to care. I mean, I'm down for however long we need to go. So let's do it. You've got your wine. You're all yeah. good to go. Yeah. I'm all right. It's quite nice, actually. It's three pounds off at Tesco. Um, <laughs> it's an Australian Merlot, uh, Firemark. Uh, when you go in there, please mention my name and I get 1% back of what you spend. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Amazing. <laughs> There we go. Um, <laughs> right, where were we? Uh, wilderness. The, the, uh, yeah, so, so wilderness going. Now, that was something that I, looking back on, I think was the wrong decision to make um, because the, 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 I guess the, the reason for it didn't make sense looking back at it um, because the problem we had back then, which I think something we went out quite publicly with, was uh, we had real-world trading abusing credit cards, um, stolen credit cards. Uh, your credit card company, if you have too many chargebacks, they take your ability to take away credit cards or take credit cards as, as payment. And that would uh, effectively have wiped out 80% uh, of the revenue coming to Jagex and caused the company to fold. You know, that, that's that's the, the situation we're in. Um, so the decision was made that uh, we've got to stop trading. Um, I came up with a system of doing it, and I was not involved in any of the discussions until it had been made, the decision had been made, this is what we're doing. Um, it was all right, okay, fair enough. Um, and then it was like, we're also going to get rid of the wilderness and change how the wilderness works. And it's like, well, why? 
So there's this PKing community, there's this whole PvP community that understands how it works. And back then, it wasn't about the items. It was about the, the camaraderie of the clans, about the um, excitement of, of the experience of fighting with a group of people against another group of people. It wasn't about getting the money and the items from the other people. That was always nice, but when you're in a clan fight, the first thing you did was, uh, if you killed somebody, you picked up their food. You left their room sets on the floor, and the room sets back then were like 800, 900 GP, 9,000 GP or something. So you left the room sets on the floor, you picked up the food, because that's what was going to keep you alive. Um, and that's that, That's how you played. Um, so when the wilderness went, I mean, the big question was, well, why didn't you just stop drops from happening and allow it to to continue being exactly the same? And the clans just went in droves off to Guild Wars 2 and to, uh, what was the other one? Guild Wars 2 and to Tribalism, I think the game was called. Oh, the Tribals, I think, yeah. The Tribal yeah. War or something, yeah. something like that, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that was, that, that that really didn't make a lot of sense to be looking back at it. And uh, I wish I was in a position back then to be able to stand up and say, look, this this is not right. This is not the right way of doing it. Um, we need to think more about it. And, yeah. Worked, though. I mean, it kept the company afloat, which is good. So, I mean, that 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 was a positive move. But the world, uh, that is the day, I think, that PvP, uh, for me, died. And I think it did for many, many other people. I don't think we've ever recovered from that. In your mind, because we'll, we'll get to old school and talk about uh, how you joined it, but in your hmm. mind, when did RuneScape stop being fun for you? That would have probably been about 2008-ish. Okay. And it was nothing to do with the game whatsoever. Um, the reason being... An echo on my side. Hang on. Yeah, Hang on. It's got, Hang on. It's got, Close your ears, everybody. He's switching his outputs, so it's gone a bit quiet. Oh, 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 we got flashing. Oh, yeah, still here. Echo? I'm not hearing echo, so I think we're good. There yeah. you go. Yeah, there's, there's a bit that happens with the mic occasionally. Um, uh, anyway, um, yeah, so 2008, it was nothing to do with the game whatsoever. It was to do with, back then, we had so many abuse reports coming in. Your entire day was... Uh, looking at the worst parts of the community saying the worst things possible and it wasn't a case of you know funny things all the time there was just abuse after abuse after abuse everything from um uh discussions about child abuse to rape to the worst possible subjects you can imagine and that's what you had eight hours a day for months upon months and when you got to that that stage of just dealing with it and having to understand it and there's no extra support either there was no um, there's no counselling to help the people who are working through this deal with it. Uh, you got to a stage where you just can't physically log into the game. It makes you sick to 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 want to log into the game. You're like, I just can't deal with these people because that's all you see is just the worst and the worst and the worst and the worst. And um, that, that's when that's when the game for me was like, well, that's 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 it. I'm done. And that's when I sort of stopped playing. Um, I mean, I've 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 played since and I've logged in, logged out, and and what have you. And I've played since I've left a lot more than I have in the you know, 10, 11 years previous to that. Um, because there's, there's, uh, there's um, yeah, you just can't do it after dealing with that. And uh, sorry, I mean, Farmer Man Bill just mentioned I thought it was automated. Back then it wasn't, now it is. And there's a lot more clever ways of dealing with it where they can you look at um, uh, phrases that can automatically get uh, processed and get escalated to the top of queue. So you're always looking at the right stuff. Uh, but uh, right now, um, yeah, but right back then, it was all done by somebody looking at it and just looking at the just pure abuse of bad things day in, day out. And that's when you're like, emotionally, you can't deal with it. It's, it's tough. It's fair. Um, okay. Any Anything else that comes to mind from that time? Um, so what else happened? Um, EOC. Yes. Oh, I forget about EOC. I was, I was there for EOC. Um, that was a tough one because back then I was working for the publishing department uh, when EIC happened and I went and helped out back on RuneScape back then so I sort of went to work with the publishing department that worked on games such as um, 
War of Legends, um, Ace of Spades, Ace of Spades, yeah, War of Legends, Ace of Spades, Eight Realms, the other two, two, Eight Realms. Yep. Um, what was the other one? Carnage Racing, we Carnage, had Carnage fun, fun Up. God, that was a game fun we killed up. quick because it was terrible. Um, fun up. and Fun Orb, no, this was post Fun Orb, oh, post Fun Orb, okay. already gone and forgotten about by then. Armies of Gilano? Um, no, that was part of Fun Orb. Okay. Come on, there's the other one. There's the shoot, block and load. That was it. Right, block and load. Okay, let's let's take a step back a second. Block and load was in twenty uh, towards the end of 2014. So I think you were involved with Ace primarily, and then I think when you made yeah, it to Old Schools, when block... block and load was just kicking off. Yes. I think uh, back then because they were doing Eight of Spades too, and that's what formed into block and load. I got invited to uh, <laughs> fun time. The fun the first time I ever interacted with Jagex, I got invited to um, one of those survey play tests, and it was for. Um, at the time, Ace 2, and um, that kind of formed a connection that I had with Jagex and eventually mm. led to me, along with helping them at events and stuff, getting there. So, you know, very grateful for that, that's for sure. Absolutely. I've got an interesting story about something. I don't know if you want me to tell you a story, but I'm going to tell it because it's... Uh, oh, boy. It's, well, it's, it's quite it, a nice story, and you might not know this story. Okay. It's about you. Oh, no, right? it's about me, okay. Yeah, so this makes it even more more interesting. Um, so this has nothing to do with anything uh, that we talk about, but it's when um, uh, Block and Load was uh, on its way out, I think, and they were dissolving the final bits of the team. And there was a discussion about, you know, who should we keep out of that team? Because obviously redundancies were being talked about. Uh, who do we get rid of? How do we deal with that? And uh, I remember sitting there with, who was with us? With the um, VP of product and I think the, uh, I think CO was in the room and a few other people. And I was like, if there's one person we've got to save out of here, we've got to keep because they add a huge value to this company, it's Shawnee. And that's that's the person that we have to make sure we keep. And uh, because that was back when, you know, you could see quite clearly your your passion for anything that Jagex does. Uh, it was like, that is something that will immediately plug into RuneScape and will be a massive help for them. Wow, I wasn't expecting a stream that may make me cry. Um, okay, so I guess if we're on the point of stories, I've never really told this story before. Um, so um, when Block and Load, so uh, it was really bad timing. We went to a team jolly, um, you know, and we had the impression, oh, we're going to a jolly, so we must be doing okay. Um, I come in the next day, and my day start at twelve o'clock, and I finish at nine o'clock. So I was doing streams during that day, so that was my shifts. So I walk in, um, I go up to the, the second floor where they're at, and all the computers are empty, all the desks are empty, and I see um, two people who I get on really well with outside this meeting room that I know can hold a lot of people in there, and I could see them crying, and I literally was like, oh fuck. Like, I walk in, as I poke my head around the corner, there's someone from HR literally giving the speech about you know, the, the downsizing as it were. So from that moment, um, I was made redundant um, from Jagex and Block and Load and what I did. And everyone else um, went to the, drown their sorrows off in the pub and stuff. But me and this other person decided to still go ahead with the stream and not give any impression that anything had happened because at the end of the day, we enjoyed them and we never... Um, you know, we never uh, wanted that to come across that way. We enjoyed it. We knew it was probably the last stream we were going to do because it was coming towards the end of the year. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was that story, really. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's... I mean, there's nothing bad in sharing that because at the end of the day, this happens. But, you know, uh, everyone who... I can tell you this. Everyone who I knew from that has gone on and they're in the industry still. They're still kicking ass and so on. So, you know, there's a, a positive side to that story at the very least. Hmm. So, and to your point of that story, I didn't know that. Um, what I do know is that uh, I was told that I barely got onto the RuneScape community team when I first joined, and I used that as a a fire, like something lit inside me big time. Because I was hmm. like, I've just been made redundant. I've just been told that I only barely got this job. So I was like, do you know what? F I, in other words, I was just like, do you know what? Fuck you. I'm gonna just prove everything and do everything I can to make this the best I can be. So that was just the approach I had really. So um I appreciate you going to bat for me. I didn't know that. Um well thank you for making sure that um <laughs> I still had a job, I guess. <laughs> so uh, well, yeah that, world, that, mean, that means a lot to me. Um I still remember uh um, made you cry <laughs> 
Um, I still remember, uh, completely unrelated, while we're on the topic of stories, um, I still remember you telling me the story about, uh, while we were outside the stream room, I can't remember why we were both talking to each other outside the stream room, but you were talking to me about um, how, you, I can't remember what the procedure's called, uh, the, where you get snipped, basically. What's the name of oh, that? Oh, vasectomy, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you told me about the vasectomy story, and I can't remember, <laughs> I don't know why you told me about this at the time, but I was really waiting to go. story, that's why. Yeah, do, you wanna, do you wanna tell the story? I, I've never told it on stream before, and I think this is a good stream to tell it on. Oh my goodness! I think there's multiple people who've heard it in real life, but um, but <laughs> but so I've got um, I, I've got four children. Um, so um, uh, my wife said to me, "You're not you're not coming near me again unless you get that thing chopped off." <laughs> so I, I I went and had a vasectomy. So there I am lying on the operating table, and you're awake during the process as well. Um, uh, you are tackle out on the operating table. They've got local anaesthetic. And uh, you got your hands here because the doctor said, this is my clean area. You can't touch your nuts no matter what. You're like, okay. So he's, um, he's, he's, he's getting on with the process. And uh, he's like, uh, so, so what do you do for a living then? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a community manager. <laughs> and uh, he's like, so, uh, so what's one of those then? And uh, it's like, how do you explain what a community manager is for a game studio to a doctor? I mean, this doctor's been at university for you know, a billion years, very serious. You know, he earns, he earns you know, seven million pounds a minute. Um, how do you explain what a community manager is to a doctor? And he's like, so I was like, well, I sort of help people play computer games. And he's like, so uh, what sort of computer games? <laughs> And I'm like, he's, like, I'm like look, look. he's been in this situation so many times. He's just trying to make me feel comfortable because, you know, lying on a table, tackle out um, with a doctor um, with a soldering iron, basically uh, three inches deep in your nads is, um, is, is not your natural position to be in. <laughs> so, I, uh, so I was like, OK, uh, how do you explain RuneScape to a doctor? who doesn't really care about the answer, he's just trying to make conversation, who doesn't know what a computer game is, who has never played any sort of thing. And I was like, oh, well, yeah. you, know, you get a sword, you kill you kill goblins, you kill people, and he's like, like RuneScape. <laughs> and, uh, he, he, he put himself through university by abusing bugs in RuneScape. <laughs> that was my vasectomy story. Um... Oh goodness! That's why it's such a good story. It, just works, it was just a it was just a randomness. Like we were waiting uh, outside the stream room. I still don't know what for. I think it was it might have been me or something. And he just decided to just tell me the story, and I was just literally. I, I, I actually thought he was joking because of the the because he still does it now. The hand gestures and everything else that he does with it. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a true story. Um, <laughs> just yeah. It's because I knew um, you would be somebody who would understand and appreciate it. That's why. <laughs> and it's a great, it's a great, um, I think, icebreaker into uh, into yeah. real good friendship, which is what I what I feel I got with you. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I feel the same. Yeah, but we obviously. But, you was, know. Uh, but I, the, the most interesting part was I had the vasectomy uh, the week before Roomfest at uh, Tobacco Docks. Anyone who went to Tobacco Docks knows all you've got are stairs absolutely everywhere. So I'm walking down the stairs, sort of like, ow, ow. And Ash is next to me at the time. And he's, he's like, I, I feel I should be asking you fucking help, but I don't know how I could. <laughs> he's like, yeah, that's fair point. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Right. Uh, any of the yeah, stories? Anyway. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, we kind of went into how basically you bas made sure that you put a good word in and I still had a job at Jagex after I was made redundant. Yeah. So. Well, I think that was down to you being who you were. And that's that, that's the reason you got you kept your job at Jagex, nothing else. Um, so apart from that, any other stories for going to old school or? Oh, what else happened back then? So we had EOC. Um, EOC was, a was, was, I think, I, I think it was the right thing. I, if we hadn't have had EOC, we wouldn't have had old school. Um, I think that's definitely true. Um, if you look at the amount of people playing RuneScape after both games are out, it was bigger than than it not happening being so overall it was a good thing i don't think anyone expected it to be a good thing um that in that way um but i think my, my the feedback i gave to eoc when i first found out it was happening and the way it was happening from a community perspective is like right what we've got to do then is we've got to make sure everybody understands it on day one so they log in they know what they're doing and i think that's the big failure we had 
Um, had it have been put out there, had we listened to the feedback to start with and adapted it and changed it, not necessarily stopped it, because I think that's what a lot of the criticism was, we should never have done it. I think we probably should have done. Um, uh, because I think the game would be worse today than if we hadn't have done it. Um, but I think we needed to make sure people understood what it was, how to use it. Um, I, I, I still think that I had this great idea, and I still think it's great, but then I'm a bit biased on these things, um, of, of just creating cards of all the different skills you could have and allowing people to start building them and sending them out to the customers. You have physically the cards in your hand and go, all right, I'm going to build this thing and being able to do that. And I think that was a that, that was a big thing we missed. We just didn't educate people or help people understand how it was going to work. And um, that's why dogs squeak in a toy, by the way, uh, Virgie. <laughs> I think um, um, it's a Brussels sprout. I think a oh, Brussels sprout toy. I see. Yeah, a Brussels, Brussels squeaky Brussels sprout. I, I do think if EOC had launched with a combat mode nowadays called Revolution, it would have been a completely mm. different perception. I think mm. I stand by yeah, that. Right. It, took, it took a year for it to happen. So, um, how was it internally? Was there a split? Or um, internally, well, back then there was. You didn't have. You weren't allowed an opinion. This was a case of this is what we're doing. You can say what you like. We're, this is what we're doing. Wow! Okay. It was dictated wow. rather than um, also a dictated rather than um, a conversation or a, or a or an opinion. Dictated rather than docu uh, wow! What's the word? Democracy. That's the one. Um, which you know it, it should have been. Um, um, yeah. So it, this is what's going to happen. It's like how do we make a best of a bad situation? Let's do it this way. Um, yeah. Okay. So, anything else in that time before old school? Um, I don't know. There must have been other stuff. Have the chat got anything we haven't covered? Because I've, I've pretty much seen all of it. So, yeah, so, so questions from 2005 to 2012 is what we're looking yes. for. Someone said Return of the Wildy. Dice class. That was a lovely day. That was oh, when the wilderness came back. I felt so good about that. Dice, Dice clans. Uh, I think that's probably a. a Escapey thing more than anything. Oh yes, Rob Point. We did, we did. I think we just identified that it was bad, and then we just changed it. That was that was it. Zesima, okay, Zesima. What do I know about Zesima? So I, I spoke of Zesima quite a lot. Um, we still chat on occasion as well. Uh, very nice chat. Very private guy. He's lovely. Uh, Absolutely lovely. Yeah, really nice chat. Um, there's not a lot to say about him. He's just like a normal guy who just plays the game. From he used to um, level up while studying for his is it microbiology degree or marine biology degree, um, which is why he got to level one because that's what he used to do while he studied. And uh, it's like, all right, that's there's nothing really more to say to him. We about him, really. we have talked about the Falador Massacre. We actually talked about a story that we've never heard of the Falador Massacre. So you'll have to uh, watch back on the stream uh, or find a timestamp for that one, unfortunately. But maybe to check mm. and fill you in. Um, actually, while we're on the topic of players, Zezima, is there any other players to stand out uh, during that time? Um, who else? I mean, one of the nicest people I've met. I mean, I've met so many nice people uh, through the game over the years. But one of the nicest people has to be Green 098, who I think was uh, third in the high scores at one point. Um, just a really nice mum and grandma. You know, she's just a a pleasant person who's lovely to talk to, who's nice to have a conversation with, um, and it's just like talking talking to a friend. And one of the biggest things I found when when becoming a P mod to start with, people react differently to you as a P mod. Hmm. Now, when you're a J-Mod, people react differently to you as a J-Mod. And so in order to get a real understanding of people, you've got to uh, uh, go in incognito and just see what's going on um, and just talk to people because that's when you get the real person. I always felt with Green that she was just real all the way through, didn't matter what, what it was. It was she was uh, one of the nicest people I met Green was. And there's, there's so many others that I'm doing a disservice by not being able to name them all. But, um, I mean, there, there are so many good stories as well about people who have who have personally benefited from RuneScape. So you think of, um, I mean, the amount of people who have met on RuneScape and got married, there must be hundreds upon hundreds of that, and that's just such a wonderful thing to happen. There's people who, who have come to me and said, um, if it wasn't for RuneScape, I wouldn't have got past my parents dying. Um, and there's, there's 
there's people who've had mental health problems where RuneScape's helped them for it. People have learned English language because of RuneScape. Um, people who are now coders. I was, okay, this is a bizarre thing. Last week, I was on a call to uh, Wargaming, uh, which are the big people who do World of Tanks. And I was just chatting to one of their, one of those guys, and they were like, oh, my God, you're Mob Matt Kate. You're the reason I'm doing the job I'm doing now, because because all the stuff that you did with Old School RuneScape, that was RuneScape, sort of inspired me to be here. And so it happens. And, you know, it, I was, again, this week, in fact, on um, Wednesday, I'm stood in the office. In the office we're in, um, we're in something called a mind space, which has, uh, you rent out office space. It's in the middle of London. Snowbee owns their own office in London. It's all owned by the Queen and the Duke of Westminster and stuff. Um, and this is basically you rent office space from this company and they have a central coffee area um, where you all go and get your coffee and it's a real nice, real nice place. I'm standing there getting a coffee machine. This chap comes up to me and he's like, I, it sounds a really strange question, but did you work at Jagex? And I have this conversation with him and he's like, yeah, no, this is, this is, this is why I'm, I'm working here now because uh, he's worked for a different company in the same space. But it's like, I, the reason I'm working for this company is because I want to do the stuff that Jagex did. And, you know, it's... it's it's, it's not just the big famous people, you know, it's the, all the impact you have on all the hundreds of thousands of people, on the millions of people, tens, hundreds of millions of people that have gone through um, RuneScape over the years. And hopefully some of them, they're all a little bit better for having that experience. That's, that's, that's why I did what I did for almost 15 years. And uh, that's why I do what I do now, it's there to help people make, make the world a better place. Who would have thought a computer game could do that, eh? Anything else? Anything else? Sorry, I'll shut up now. Yeah, I'm done. no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to keep asking in case there's anything else you want to do. I have no problem. Has anybody Take said anything in the chat about pre, pre old school stuff? Well, don't, we'll, we'll cover mod jet. I've got some cool stories about mod jet, so don't worry, we'll get there later. Um, oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's brilliant. You, you've not heard this one, surely, so you'll love this. Oh, good. Okay, this, this, this will make your eyes widen and in panic. <laughs> oh, god. Um, <laughs> So obviously someone's mentioned Breach. I'm presuming if we're talking about Re if you're talking about Reach, I'm presuming you're going to talk about Reach. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, we'll, have chat, we'll have a chat about Dan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, um, the well, I'll tell you what. Um, another thing about the high level forum was uh, when Clan support came out, uh, the Clan Clan system, and I had to get um, proper written permission to be able to start up a clan just for the uh, high level players to go into it because they were dead against clans at the time. They were like. Clans, the worst thing in the world. We shouldn't, shouldn't allow that to happen at all. And uh, so I sort of said to him, I was like, well, I'm going to open up a clan. You guys can uh, go and use it. You can." My, my intention was they go in, they find out all the cool stuff about it, they then migrate into the other clans, and you know they, they, that would happen. But no, Max players, being who they were, they decided they wanted to make their clan number one, and so they made my clan number one. And I was like, should have seen that coming, really, shouldn't I? <laughs> when you call the clan Max as well, I mean, it kind of... Yeah, we called it... the clan Max, yeah. We had it as uh, 99, uh, 99k on it and everything. So, yeah, so that was the Max players for you. You give them something and they, they just want to be the best at it. That's, that's what we did. So. Um, do you reckon you could have done more for early content careers other than the Orb of Oculus? Oh, we could have done, yeah. I don't think we understood the importance of it, though. That's the problem. I think with content creators... I think we were quicker on the uptake than a lot of other companies. Agreed. But I remember, okay, well, first time um, I went to stream, um, I don't know if you remember Rich Barham. He used to be head of community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I know that um, I, I, I went to him and I said, you know, this is after I'd started old school, and I said, you know, I want to stream because that's what our players seem to be doing. It seems sensible for us to be doing it and seeing, seeing what it's about. And he's like, no, 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 it's a fad. It's not going to catch on. Why would anybody want to play uh, computer and watch people play computer games? It's, it's, it's a waste of time. Don't even waste your time doing it. So I actually went home and did it anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> end of the day, my shift had finished. I was like, sorry, I'm going to sit on my own computer and uh, I'm, going, I'm going to stream from my computer at work. Um, it, it only lasted six months, this guy did. So, uh, yeah, for obvious reasons. Um so uh, I sat there, and uh, the first stream I did as a JMod, just streaming, and it was I was typing in the chat. I wasn't even talking to people. I was just streaming the game and typing in the chat. And I had about 300 people come up and watched. And I was like, well, this is a bit weird. You know, I'll, uh, this, this, this is, there's a lot of people watching me do this. It's a bit strange. So we did it again the next week, and about 3,000 people turned up to watch. Wow. And uh, it just spun on from there. And by that time, I'm like, look, come on. <laughs> 
we can't ignore this anymore. But by that time, I think he was uh, on his way out the door. So I uh, just carried on doing it. And um, great thing about old school at the beginning was uh, was everybody ignored us and left us to do what we wanted to do. So we just broke every rule that we could just to just to show our our, our way of doing things. Um, and the the so yeah, so about old school, I guess. Um, right at the very beginning, I've always believed that the most important people. Um, for the company were the players. And that's something I've always believed. It's something that Jagex hasn't always um, been behind. And I remember having conversations years ago, and there's this very anti-player opinion. It was almost like the players were the bad people, and we had to stop them and, and ban them because we're making the games the developers wanted to play. And it's like, well, we're not really making the games for them we're making the games for the players and because i came from the players i sort of understood the importance behind it and the the importance of the game to them so when old school came along um it came out and uh, so yeah we're gonna even go back even further now um so so when old school came out uh i was working for the publishing department and one thing i had realized was that the publishing department had spent their entire year's budget in the first six months of the year there was no games likely to be produced um and uh the games that were in flight were so terrible i was like that this this isn't going anywhere this department so i went to my boss which was rich at the time and uh said look can you get me the old school gig because the way i saw it i had six months left at jagex i'd spend six months in the publishing department before it got canned um because i'd run out of money or i could spend six months working on something i really was passionate about which was old school and everybody expected it to die in six months um and uh, so uh, he said, uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I'll get you the gig. And he got me the gig straight away. So I was like, that's, that's the only good thing he did for me, I think. Um, so, uh, so I got that. And, um, and and five months and two weeks later, an email went around the company saying that the publishing department had shut down and they made everybody redundant. So I was like, ah, I dodged that bullet. I believe um, it's called Assembly Call back then. That was, it. that was it. I was trying to remember what it was yeah. called and I just couldn't for the life of me remember what it was called. Yeah. Um, I, we kept... The people I cared about. So um, you'll remember Sally. Yep, person who got me the majority. Yeah, so we kept X. Sally. So that was good. Forever grateful She's got for Sally. Great stuff now, isn't she? So, I was, I was, uh, I was uh, stalking her on Facebook the other day, and uh, <laughs> she's she's, uh, <laughs> she's having a great time by the look of things. So that's good. Um, anyway, anyway, um, where was I going with this? So, so yeah, so I was in old school RuneScape. Nobody expected it to, to last for six months. And there was me, there was Nexus, there was uh, Ash, and then Dan joined us as well. And uh, it was a case, all right, how do we approach this? Um, and fortunately, we're all like-minded, which was quite good. And it's like, okay, Dan, bless him, wanted to be the anarchical um sort of punk type person who just wanted to rebel against anything he was ever told i see uh, which i think was dan all over um and so you know when i said you know we ought to do what we we thought was right we think's right and uh, you know we ought to listen to the players uh, we ought to uh, engage with them in conversation because i mean like i said earlier back then the mentality was you say nothing unless you know you're allowed to say it and i was like well, we're going to turn that on ahead let's just have a thing of saying we're going to say everything Unless we definitely know we can't, and that was that was the first step that we made to to actually change how um, how we communicated as as a team and as a product. And uh, so that was step number one. And the other thing was this huge list of rules you had for how you behaved on a JMod, and I was like, mm, the guide, we're going to the JMod, the JMod guidebook. Oh, yes, yes, uh, yes, I remember this. So that, so that went in the bin, and uh, I thought we'd break that because nobody was paying the blindest bit of attention to us. We had a meeting once a week with a sub sub product project manager um, that that you know didn't honestly care about what we were doing and thought it was a waste of time spending half an hour talking to us. So we were like, "Oh, we can do what the hell we like. Nobody cares." So we did, and uh, we tried to do the best we could. And we we didn't have any tools to do anything with, and. Uh, so there's Ash and there was Nexus trying their best to create content that we could use. Um, and the only thing we really had that we had any leverage with was the rare items. And that was sort of the first step of the thing we could do. So we put out a poll and said, would you like the rare items back in game? And everyone was like, yeah, we want them back in game. But nobody could decide on the best way of doing it. 
So we had to come up with a sensible way of doing it. And the way we came up with was, well, what we'll do is every holiday event, we will drop them into game because the one thing that's coming back to us from the community is they should not be rare items that you hoard and become billions of dollars worth of uh, blue party hats because um, that's not really what they're about and that's not really what people want. Um, so I'd have this constant. So it's almost like this halfway house. Of if they come out every year, in the summer, the price will be higher because you've got a long time to wait to get them again and they'll be less on the market. So there's always you'll always make some money out of it and you can always collect enough of them to, to make a few quid or a few GP, I should say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, but uh, you can never, um, it will never get to the problem that it is now in RuneScape. Um, so, uh, so, we, so we made that, that sort of thing. Then we started giving out, um, uh, giving them out at events in the first sort of you know, six months because we had nothing else we could do. We're sitting there scratching our butts going, you know, we can't actually create anything. Everything takes so long to do. Uh, we could do lots of little things, but you know, this is something where we can do events every week and we can put in some little helpers um, for Matt so that he can go in and do his, uh, do his community stuff. Um, and that's, that's basically how we started doing it. And when obviously when people came in to start playing the game, I think we had 300,000 players on day one come in to play RuneScape uh, and play old school. And it dropped off really quickly, as, as one expects from any new game. Uh, people were just, the game was just hemorrhaging players. And uh, then we started dropping these things. And you used to, so instead of the graph going down, you see these little bumps that used to happen. Boom, boom. And then we got to, uh, got to things like Christmas crackers and party hats. And people went nuts for those. And you could actually see a significant spike of people coming in just to get those items. And uh, it's like, okay, this is, this, is, this is getting quite fun. And that's when we started experimenting as well with the streaming. So what could we do on the streams that, that would actually make this a much more interesting and exciting sort of uh, experience for people? And it works an absolute treat. And I remember at times, um, I think I spent about three months streaming every single day. Um, I so I'd do my day job because these streams were outside of work time as well. So I'd do my day job. I'd then stream. I then go home. So I mean, I was getting up for work. I was getting in for work at you know nine o'clock in the morning and not leaving till nine o'clock at night. Uh, there was like twelve hour days for about three months solid to actually go and do it. And then started doing it from home as well, so I can actually carry that on throughout the weekends because that's when the players are online. So it's like, why don't why we should be doing stuff when it's most suitable for the players? Um, and you could just see as it, just that graph just started getting less and less severe until it sort of leveled out. And uh, sort of about October. 2013 it, it it stopped going down and that was the day we uh, managed to get um uh, uh uh oh crap what's it called uh god wars into game and the day we got god wars into game it started going up and it's gone up ever since until i left and it started going down <laughs> nice so do you think that was the catalyst absolutely dead set and god wars dungeon being the kickstarter for old school's mm. popularity i think what happened was they could see the passion of the people working on it we had built the relationship with a whole bunch of players with a whole bunch of streamers because we were learning to stream alongside the streamers as well i mean it's one of the reasons i've got such a great relationship with you know all the old streamers that are out there everybody from uh Boaty and foe and emily and everybody who streamed back then i've got such a strong relationship with all of those guys um, because we did it together, we went through that process together of learning what streaming was about and how we how we move forward uh, with that. And um, we did it together. We you know we were we were one group of people. We weren't we were Jagex and the players. This was we were old school people. Whether we worked for Jagex, whether we worked whether we were were players, whether you know whoever you were, we were one group of people to. Uh, wanting to make the best out of this game feeling the world was against us because you know we could never get anything out of jagex to do it there were four of us working on it um i had to fight for our uh, jollies <laughs> nice <That's your> <laughs> but we got them because i thought you know for fuck's sake well, at least we're going to get 30 quid ahead of a quarter to actually go and uh, go and have a decent meal down down uh, in a restaurant somewhere and uh, we got that and um you know, I think it was because we were such a, a close group of people when God Wars hit. That was the moment where people realised, actually, if this game can develop, then this game has a future. And that's when it sort of went from down to up. And then it grew from that. Um, and God Wars was such a fundamental shift in what old school was about that it was it, 
you know, that day you're like, right, this is now when people are going to start paying attention. And so, so we grew the game. So you mentioned this is in 2013. So you mentioned in 2014 you stepped up to become product manager of Old School. In essence, um, just so people understand it, you were essentially the executive producer of Old School, i.e. the guy in charge. Is that correct? Yeah. So How did that come about? There was... It's difficult. So you you look at how you operate as a business unit. So you sit there and think right at the very beginning, there were three of us, four of us, uh, we were working together. We were doing the best that we could, um, and somebody needed to tell people uh, what what was going on. We needed to, at some point to tell the managers what was going on, the senior people, so they could write it down in a report somewhere and then continue to forget about us for the next month. And uh, so, <laughs> which was which was my aim, pretty much. How could we keep so far under the radar that we could just allow to do the right thing without without corporate um, interference? Um, and uh, so I just took on the responsibility myself. And it's, I had a conversation with one of the guys I work with now who's uh, struggling a bit. And I said, uh, the way, reason I've got to where I am now um, is because I took responsibility for what needed to be done. It wasn't my job to do it. I could have sat there and said, I'm the community manager. I'm going to write the news post. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. But I'm not going to touch any of that stuff over there because I'm the community manager. And... I took responsibility for all the other stuff that needed to be doing. It's like, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I know you need that to happen. I'll do that. We'll make this happen. And then, you know, we, 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 it wasn't just me. The whole team took on responsibility. And uh, by taking on that responsibility, we all sort of grew ourselves and um, individually within the team. And Ash didn't stay as a developer. He ended up as a principal developer. Um, and uh, he ended up leading people. And uh, it was, you know, developing people and growing in that way. And we all, we all, we all, by working together, taking responsibility together, um, accepting that responsibility and taking, you know, with the accountability that we, if we don't get it right, then, you know, we're in trouble, um, that, we, that we want to deliver. And I think anybody who's who's listening, who wants to get on in careers, taking, that's the key thing. You take responsibility for what you want to do. Sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes you mess up. Sometimes you make mistakes. That's fine. But you keep taking that responsibility. You keep trying to do the best thing you can. And yes, it is a Death Star behind me. You're quite right. Um, it is actually a lampshade Death Star. I used Aww. to have it on here, but but it's just great. That sounds amazing. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So it's a lampshade uh, Death Star. Uh, amazing. Yeah. Cost, cost about a pound, I think, from some cheap old shop. <laughs> I just plug around. I've got, I haven't got lights that will work on it here anymore because I've got spotlights rather than... Uh, Rather than hanging light, got but, fancy anyway. lights, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, you moved into yeah. product manager, old school, twenty fourteen. Uh, was this yeah. at the start of twenty fourteen, or was this mid twenty fourteen, or? Oh, you know what? I can't remember. I mean, this job title change was so indifferent to me that I was like, "Well, my job's not changing. I'm still doing what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do the best thing for old school, for the players, for the team that are working with me, and trying to make." You know, make this this world a better make, make make the game a better place and make it have more of an impact in the world. And uh, the, the actual job title itself, I can't honestly remember because it just really wasn't that important to me. Can you remember any projects back then that came up and you said no to? That's a tough one. I understand, but yeah, anything that springs to mind. Project I said no to. Were there any? I don't. I don't think we were so. There's so little we could do, and we were so focused on, on, the players that back then. But there's only one project in the whole of old school that I've, um, that, I think should have gone into game that I said no to, and that was, um, the Bounty Hunter Two, uh, update. Why did you and say I that? Blocked I blocked that for about 18 months to two years because my belief in that, I, I posted this on Reddit the other day, um, my belief was that the Bounty Hunter 2 update wouldn't solve the problem that needed solving. And the problem that we needed to solve um, was how do we, how does PVP work? What is PVP in old school? And um, we got to a stage 
2017 or so. The, the PvP that I understood it to be, uh, back when I was playing it in 2005, 2007, wasn't, wasn't what PvP now was. It was so far advanced. Um, it was so different that... Uh, that we as a company didn't, they didn't work on it for two years. No, they, I blocked it for two years, so they didn't work on it. Um, they only started working on it after I left, I think. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 we as a company didn't understand what PVP needed to be. We had a few people with a few ideas, but we didn't understand what PVP needed to be and where it needed to go. And, and from my understanding of Jagex right now, they still don't. So my approach was, right, we have a dead man mode, which has been quite successful. Um, so that is an area of PvP, but we need to understand PvP as a whole. How does that work into the PvP strategy of where it's going, where the players want it to go, and how do we make it more fun, more enjoyable, and more inclusive for people so they could get into it? Um, we never got that together. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's my fault. I was I was running the project that we never put that as a high enough priority, partly because I didn't understand it, so I didn't have an opinion on where it needed to be, so I had to rely on other people's opinions to inform me. Um, but we just didn't have those opinions, and I didn't go out and get those, and that's something that I, I feel quite bad about. I could have solved that problem had I put the right focus on it. Um, Staker Shock is going to have a drink every time I say PvP. Good. So Good talking time. more about PvP, <laughs> the PvP that I was uh, thinking about, um, was very PvP-ish. and uh... <laughs> So uh, I'm going to yeah. throw three things at you and you decide what you want to talk about first. So this did the, I think these happened in 2014, but let's just assume this is 2014 to 2015. Three things. You decide what you want to talk about first. Do you want to talk about Reach? Do you want to talk about Crack the Clue? Or do you want to talk about Zaya? Uh, let's talk about Crack the Clue. Sure. Because that's much more positive than the other two. Sure. Um, and and it's probably more exciting to me um, because I know where it came from. And uh, there was, uh, I read a book years and years ago called The Mayan Prophecies. Uh, and it was a book about um, a sarcophagus that was discovered in one of the Mayan cities. Um, and it was called the uh, Sarcophagus of Palenque, I think, P-A-L-E-N-Q-U-E. And uh, when they found this sarcophagus, it had this beautiful lid on it with just this really bizarre picture. It looked like somebody flying a spaceship. And they're like, come on, this is, this is you know, 600, 700,000 years or however old it was. Um, uh why has it got somebody flying a spaceship on it? And it looks, I mean, if you look it up on the internet, it looks like somebody flying a spaceship. Uh, it's like, it's, this is really bizarre. And then they noticed that it had a corner broken on it. And they're like, this ain't right. You know, this is obviously so much effort has gone into creating this, this sarcophagus for this, you know, God, you know, somebody who's perceived as a God in this, this, uh, this society that, had they have broken it, taken it down to put on his sarcophagus, they would have gone and made another one and taken it down there and not broken it the next time. Now, so this crack, this this chipped corner has to be deliberate. Um, and it turned out what happened was this this uh, this archaeologist made an acetate of the image on the top. He made two of them. He started crossing it over using different sort of points he found all over the, uh, the, the top of the sarcophagus and ended up mapping out the entire history of the Mayans just using this, this, these two acetates on top of each other and computer programs to work it out. And they'd created this thing from, uh, you know, out of their brains without computers and, and acetates. And it's a, I sat there and thought, that's such an amazing thing, the way it worked. And I was like, I want to do something which will test our players' minds uh, to see if they can figure this out and, and get it into game. And that's where Crack the Clue came from. And uh, I've always loved uh, cryptic crosswords as well, so I put that into it. And it was basically it was a case of like, I want to put something into game where we can create a story. Um, and it's, it's very marketing led. This create a story that we could put out into the public in twelve months' time, because I don't want anyone to solve this for twelve months. I want it to last as long as possible, so we can say we've done such a difficult um, thing that isn't geared towards what every other gaming company is doing, which is immediate gratification. 
uh, we did something which had a long, difficult, tough um, uh, journey to get to the end of. That uh, that that we, we we are really living our brand because we looked at old school as a tough game, a hardcore game, uh, a difficult game to play, and something that you got huge rewards of because it was such a tough thing to 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 uh, play. And that's that sort of fed in quite nicely to that, and that was the entirety of Crack the Clue. Um, and then the second one came along, and um, I did exactly the same thing for that. Um, but I did instead of having a, a tablet in my mind, I had circles in my. It was all built around circles for the second one, and how uh, and pi being a, a thing. Um, and uh, it, was, it was I absolutely loved doing it. It was absolute great fun. And what really surprised me is people took it seriously. Of course they um, did. You know, yeah. And Wooks went out and made computer programs, and <laughs> a whole Reddit grew up around it as well. And it's such a, you know, such a cool little um, something that took maybe it took me about a week to put together. It took developers maybe two hours to develop into <laughs> game. And for something like that, it just it's just that little bit of creativity of something different, not wanting to go down the same route everyone else is going. Let's do something that no one's done before, and let's be proud that we're doing that. And that's that's sort of, the, sort of one of the mentalities that really sort of lived through old school was was we want to we want to do something and not be afraid that it's going to fail. So we're going to do different things. I mean, dead dead man mode in itself, uh, the whole concept behind that is completely wrong. If you were to stand up in front of any board of any company and say, right, we have this long form game uh, where it takes a long time to level up stuff, you get rewarded for leveling up really high, you unlock the best content for for really high but we also we want to kill them and make them lose everything you know any board in the entire world will go you're absolutely crazy that's just not going to work we're not going to sanction that at all and so dead man was a complete um um we'll, we'll cover dead man later anyway oh, yeah, but it's yeah, complete yeah, yeah. complete complete um antithesis of what what we're trying to do um yes yeah, so that was that was crack the clue and i absolutely loved winding up people all the time about it it was brilliant i think it yeah i mean yeah. just from a historical purpose like i didn't play old school and i it still holds up in people i mean i'm sure the chat may agree though i'm sure they look back on it with fond memories as crack the clue it has its place in old school for what it did i mm. think it was awesome yeah that was great i really i really love doing that That's something i miss most not doing that sort of thing but yeah it's uh it was good fun i enjoyed that Hopefully players enjoyed it too. Oh, and that feeling when, when somebody finally... Oh, Silent... We haven't talked about Silent Core as well. We'll talk about him as well. Sure, sure. So he falls into the Jed Reach sort of area. Okay. okay. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about him, actually. I probably shouldn't, but you'll see me. <laughs> yes. I just want to say that uh, I'll get all the privacy notices out of the way. I am uh, I am staying silent on stuff like this. It is up to you if you want to. That's all I'm going to say on it. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, What's next? Well, I gave you two two topics to choose from. Now we can talk about Zaire. We can talk about Rich. What do you want to go with? Um, let's talk about Dan. Okay. Right. So you need a word. <laughs> before we go, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know anything in this regard, so I have nothing to worry about in that sense. But like, correct me if I'm wrong. So I'm just trying to refresh my mind on old school history. So before the the big stuff that happened, what was uh, was there a duck or something added in Falador? What was the story behind that? I don't oh, quite. God, yeah, yeah, I remember. I was, I was I was actually chatting to Emily about this the other day. It was hilarious. Um, uh, Saber Six, okay, uh, also known as Erin, which is a real name, uh, was a streamer. Um, and he made a duck. He was he was friendly with her. Um, I don't know how friendly, but friendly with her. And uh, he he put a duck in into Fadol Park called Erin, and everybody went nuts after it. <laughs> that was about it. There's nothing more exciting about that. We're like, yeah, we probably want to get rid of that duck. She was like, yeah, we probably should. Okay, let's get rid of it. Okay, so it was completely blown out of proportion in regards to oh, the reaction. Yeah, right? Just want to clear yeah. that out of the way. Um, okay, yeah. well, I guess while we're on the topic of Dan then, I mean, the floor is yours, whatever you want to say, I will leave it to you. So, uh, so what, 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 what can we talk publicly about? Now, one thing I can't talk about is the details of what happened, because obviously that would be really unfair on Dan. Um it's probably legal stuff as well, you know, privacy about individuals and what have you. 
Um, I mean, the, the, I suppose I could talk about how I felt about what happened because I was involved in the conversations. Um, I was the one who uh, first knew what was going on, instigated the investigation, and then had to had to go through the situation of having to deal with it once once what happened happened. Can you talk? So you mentioned just now you instigated the investigation. Uh, can you talk about how you got an inkling something was wrong? No. Fine. <laughs> fine. Um, I wish I could, but no, I probably should. Um, so I knew something was going on, and uh, I then went obviously to the uh, to my boss, who then got his boss. So it was uh, me, and I think it was the executive producer of RuneScape at the time. And I don't know what Neil's job title was. Um, who was my boss at the time? Oh, hello. Right, you know? Sorry, my wife just walked in. Hello. <laughs> hello, wife. How's, how's she doing? She just got home from work, bless her. And I oh, think dear. she wanted to listen in on the gossip. So yeah, can't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, go ahead. So, so I had to go speak to them, and I was like, right, I've, it's something's going on. We need to look at it. So we got the you know um, director of technology involved to start doing all the technology checks to find out what's going on. We got to a stage where nothing had happened for a month, and I'm thinking, right, thank God, I'm wrong. That's fine. I'm happy to be wrong in situations like this. Nothing bad is happening. And then after we'd had a conversation, it was like, I'm beginning to feel better about it. The next day, something happened. It's like typical. Um, so we had had the evidence of, of stuff that was going on. And uh, so obviously we sat down. It was me and again, the exec producer and uh, probably higher up by then. It was just Phil. So it was, you know, ended up being the CEO. And, uh, and it's like, right, okay. Uh, what you're going to have to do, Matt, is you, do, you, you need to call him into an office and tell him what's going on and uh, present him with the evidence. And... Um, and then uh, then we'll be we around. And I was like, well, okay, if I'm going to do that, can you make sure one of you is quite near? Because I don't know how he's going to react. I don't know if he's going to get violent. Because Dan was, it was never violent, but he was always a bit bolshy at times. And, uh, you know, when he got angry, he got a bit animated. So I was like, I just want to cover myself. You know, he wasn't at all. But um, I, I, that was one of the things that worried me. It's like, right, just make sure one of you is nearby, just in case. Um and so it said, right, okay, we, we, we've got the office set over, do it at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. So, of course, the night, that night, I got no sleep whatsoever. Came to uh, 10 to 11, it's like, yeah, we've got to delay it by an hour. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God, I'm sitting next to him at the time as well. So, you know, he's it's, it's literally sat here. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> these emails are coming in, I'm like... Whoosh. Oh, so you're trying to... Oh, my God, so you have an email coming in, you don't want him to see, because he's right next to you, you don't want him to see the emails. <laughs> Yeah. Oh so my like, God. Oh my so God. This, 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 this is what it's like. So, uh, and then it finally happened about four hours later as well. So I, I'm getting nothing done that day whatsoever. And he's asking me questions. And I'm trying to act as if nothing's going on. It's it's, it's a really difficult, tough time. And um, so then I, I, it's like right, okay, we'll do it now. So I sort of sort of went over to him and said, all right, Dan, can you uh, come with me for a minute? The walk from where we used to sit on the top floor down to the HR offices on the ground floor. You were, if I remember correctly, second floor, top right corner of the second floor, and then you had to go all the way. Yeah, because the HR was rather than bottom floor, so there was a long stair walk, right? Yeah, that seemed to take a fucking age. That oh was that was like God. hours of walking. That felt like at the time. And uh, I got into the room, and I hadn't planned what I wanted to say to him. It was like, it's like, you know, like Dan, I just don't know how to say this, but you've been doing this. And I told him I told him what we found out, and he's like, "No, no, I haven't." I was like, "Look, we've got the proof," and I just sort of lumped this big lump of paper in front of him. He didn't even look at it, and he just burst into tears. And then we had about an hour of a conversation about you know why it was happening, what had happened, and uh, and uh, so I so, you know we, we we talked about this, and um, you know I don't want to go into the details of what it was or why Absolutely it happened. Fine. Um, uh, then I had to obviously go get uh, get uh, Neil and and Phil, and they came along and they they made the final decision, and then he was he was let go. Um, and so you know I, I bumped into Dan about twelve months later, and just always sat down. I think it was uh, um, insomnia, and uh, you know, oh, I sat down and talk about it because I've never I've never felt um, anger or hate or 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 um, malice towards Dan at all. You know, I've always liked Dan, and I always will. So I mean, it was just that... a mistake, right? Like they never, it was just a silly thing he did. That's just the gist of it. Um, 
I'm not going to say that. No, no, no. <laughs> no right. So what I mean is, is that like whatever he did doesn't change his per- your perception of him as a person because of what no, happened. No, there's no right. there's no hate involved in it, yeah. and that's that's the thing. You know, I could understand why he did what he did. Um, I'm talking to him, talking to him about it twelve months later. He was still like, you know, I don't regret any of it, and I was like, oh, that's fair enough. You know, if you don't, you know, you move on with your life, you go go somewhere else, um, and you know, you, you carry on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, for the people saying Easy Audi, he sold it three months later. Well, there so, you go. Fine. <laughs> like, get to keep the Audi. I understand people are going to want gossip and stuff, but like, I completely mm. understand where Matt's coming from. Like, at the end mm. of the day, this is a person we're talking about. It probably isn't. It's absolutely not fair to them to talk about specifics on this. You know, mm. whatever was said was whatever was published in the old school news post. By the way, question: um, that old school mm. news post, I imagine, would have been very tough to write. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that one. What? Sorry. The old school news post that you wrote on the day that it happened, because obviously it was a news post that went out. I think it went out at like five six p.m. that day. I remember yeah. seeing it. That was done by Neil, so that was done by my boss because oh, the okay. team were not in a position, me included, to write anything. Um, so he did that and got that done. Um, the most difficult time was when I had to address it uh, on the stream the next day. That was the toughest time because I had to go face to camera. Uh, and explain what I could explain, and I think that 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 to me was a very emotional time, um, and uh, it was just I mean I I felt at the time just disappointment, and just wished that you know we could have been there to help more so what happened didn't happen and and make make and solve that problem because Dan was a great asset he was a he was um, a revolutionary thinker you know he had ideas that no one else would have had. That would have made the game better than it is today if he was still with us. And I, I'm disappointed that that we weren't able to utilise that uh, any more than we already did. So you and, were, uh, he came to the team as QA and went into content development. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, he was never the greatest content developer. Sorry, Dan, if you're listening. <laughs> but you know, if you didn't like doing stuff, Dan, you just didn't do it very well. And you'll be the first one to admit that. I'm sure. Um, let's talk about uh, um, the the sheer level of the. A clue update, for example. Uh, <laughs> um, he got very bored with that, and he got very sloppy towards the end. But the great thing about Dan is he had he was able to think outside the box, and that's something which I always struggled with the old school team. It was very focused on, this is what old school is, what can we do within the realms of old school? Um, trying to break outside of what was the realms of old school to do something new and unique was, was always a very difficult, difficult thing. Um, I hope that's you, Dan, saying you bought another Audi. <laughs> is that actually him? I don't know, but I bloody hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it is, then hello. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I'm not too sure. Probably It probably isn't, if I was to guess. But anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I hope it is. That'd be hilarious. So, if they'd message me if he was on, so it's fine. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, but yeah, I've, 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 I've always liked Dan. And um, yeah, he's he's been... It was it was it was disappointing for me personally when when it happened. Um, first time, because, you, first time you've done something like that, presumably, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, it was a silly mistake, and well, it wasn't a silly mistake. It was just silly. Um, and hopefully, he's learned from it, and 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 uh, his, his life seems to be going in a good direction. So that's that's positive. Awesome. Uh, okay, so onto that. I did offer you, obviously, I, I mentioned like the three topics, gone through two, uh, two of them. Number one, I mentioned is Zaya, but if there's anything else you want to bring up in the interim before we get onto Zaya, then by all means. No, no, Zaya, um, Zaya, so it's all about Zaya. Um, Zaya was uh, Dan's idea. Unfortunately, Dan wasn't with us to, <laughs> to actually see it through, so uh, I sort of took it under the mantle and, um, uh, tried to design um, uh, a continent that worked for old school. So when I was looking at it, I was like, right, what is typically old school? And you look at the map of old school, it is content in squares. Yeah. So you have a square, you fill up as much content as you can in that square. Your city is a square. Everything is a square. So we designed it around that. It's like, right, okay, this is how, uh, this is how it works. Uh, we've designed it around squares. It's all very square because that's what the rest of the continent is. We want it to fit in with the rest of the map. It looks exactly like the other staff. The cities are all squares. Unfortunately, we've got the scale wrong. Um, I made it far too big. 
um, which is completely my fault. Um, well, yeah, it's completely my fault. But again, nobody else in the team raised that this was an issue, that it was far too big. Or well, if they did, I didn't listen. And um, <laughs> we should have shrunk it down an awful lot more. And I, I'm full, very full of, uh, fully aware that I can just go headstrong into something and be lying to something, which is very useful at times. But I do need somebody to tell me to stop um, at times. Was there, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was it Zaya that had dialogue on release that kind of had like meme ish dialogue in it? Yeah, yeah, that probably wasn't the, the right way to approach it, I don't think. Um, I don't even know where those memes came from, in all honesty. There are a few things. Um, I think we made it too jokey and too fun. I think memes were just becoming a big thing back then. Uh, we were trying to be cool, we failed and just made it too jokey. Um, not serious enough. The scale was completely wrong. It's twice as big as it should have been. Uh, we should have shrunk that down. I think we got fixated, sort of thinking back, got fixated on the, it must be at least this big. It must cover at least this amount of tiles. And we didn't need to do that. But I think it was our first major update for old school when it came to a significant thing. Um... Well, I mean, if you look, so if you look back on it, obviously you mentioned about mm. learnings from it. Like, what particular learnings did you take from that for the old and the old school team in that sense when it came from Zaya and then on to your next big project, for example? Uh, don't let me design too much. It was <laughs> <one of them. laughs> um, what learnings did we get from it? We we one big thing we got from it is um, optional law was a big thing we put into that. So the library was was an optional thing you could do to understand how everything plugged together. Um, and, and that worked really well. So if you wanted to find out what had happened, you could go out and do that. But we didn't force people through that, that law thing, um, which I think worked really well. In fact, I wrote uh, on launch every single one of the books that went into the library. And there's poetry in there, so you got some of my poetry in game, um, which I don't think people really sort of connect me with uh, with writing poetry. Um, so we have poetry, we have uh, stories, we have uh, ancient documents, um, all sorts of stuff, and it's it it quite quite a cool thing. Um, the Zaya Library is horrible, yeah, but you read the stories, Dees. <laughs> you read the poetry. So um, I'm just looking back on chat. Um, what does Mackay think of the GE? Oh, he's having some wine before this one. Mm. Oh, boy. The GE was um, had to be done. Um, I fully expected it to go in, and the way we approached it was uh, we're going to do a poll which, uh, if you could say yes to everything, we'll create a GE. Um, they didn't say yes to everything, so we created the trading post, but we created it knowing that we were going to have to turn it into a GE. So we actually put all the functionality for the GE in place for the trading post. So when they said, actually, we would prefer the GE, we pulled that, got the GE, and then it was all ready to rock and roll. That's why we could do it so quickly. Um, the, the journey was quite obvious to me. It's just that I think the community needed time to, to realize they needed it. Um, and I think that that was pretty much as we expected it to happen. Um, it's, it's the right thing to do, quite frankly. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, at least you like fought ahead, you know, instead of it yeah, being a much bigger. It was, it was an obvious outcome. I mean, one of the things that uh, I learned while at Jagex was um, something called war gaming, where. Is your missus teasing you? She's just looking. She's, she's so whenever I stream, she looks at me like, "Can I walk by?" I'm like, "Yeah, you can totally walk by." And like sometimes she just wants to like try and crawl by off camera and stuff. Anyway, go ahead. Bless. <laughs> um, so, so uh, one of the things you do is you look at the situation you're in, and you look at all the options you have in front of you, and you map out what the potential options are to ultimate success. So you have, you know, we want to get to this, or you know, this is what we envisage as success. What are the different journeys you can make to get to that success? And uh, the GE was was really an obvious one. It's like, right, okay, they're saying that we'll never get a GE past the poll on the first thing because they're not entirely sure they want it, even though you know it is a really positive thing. So what we'll do is we'll give them the option of designing their own GE. 
knowing full well that by the time whatever option they get, which is less than a GE, is not going to be good enough for them, so they're going to want the GE. And it was it was a shift from 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 that through that journey towards the end of getting a GE, and that's that's basically what we we planned for, and that's what happened. So I was quite pleased about that that actually that all went to plan. So we're talking about polls. Is there anything that you wish had passed the poll? And then, in the inverse, is there anything you can't... I know it's, it's a silly question, but is there anything that you regret passing in a poll? Yeah. So let's start with what you would hope had passed. There are two things I think um, have shaped old school uh, when it comes to whether they've passed or not passed a poll. The first thing what's not passed a poll, I think, is uh, the latest skill. What in? Yeah, so the, the actual skill itself um, is, I think, immaterial. I think the concept of something new and radical has been proposed for the game and it's failed a poll. Something big, which is a game changer for the game. Um, I, I said this at the time when the poll was happening, was that the issue I now have is how does Jagex and the community react to that result? So you've got Jagex have created and put a huge amount of effort into creating this this brand new um, revolutionary thing which is going to change the game. The community has said no. Jagex's feeling is why should we put that much effort into making something which can make a real big difference again? Because the community would just say no, so we're wasting our time. Why don't we just churn out uh, a boss with a bit of a different drop table a, um, I don't know what else we have in game. Um, the latest big quest with some rewards that sound funky, but actually no one's ever going to use. Um, why should we go beyond that? Because that's what always goes through a poll. Um, my, my big concern is that if we were to poll Dead Man mode now, it would never pass. So that revolutionary, differently, different, you know, unique content, which is what old school always used to be around about doing something which everyone else was scared to do to deliver is never going to pass a poll again um, because there's just a lot more lack of trust between Jagex and, and the players now um, on both sides. And so we're just going to end up doing the safe stuff over and over again. The problem you've got with doing the safe stuff is you're doing the same stuff over and over again and you're not going to get revolutionary, you know, industry-changing stuff happen in the game and the game will just tootle along and not be any different and that's not what old school should be old school shouldn't stay still and i i i was really worried about that um and it failed and i think that's one of the nails in the coffin for the game it's not going to it's not going to revolutionize again you, not like you it did. honestly think so I absolutely i think wow. it won't it won't do anything different to what it's what what is the standard anymore it won't do anything brand new you think about what we did when the game first came out we tried to do everything different we tried to think right this is what the industry is doing fuck it we're going to go do what we want to do because we believe this is the right thing um that's not going to happen anymore it's just going to do the same thing they they're going to change and um push for the money and how you get more players in rather than doing something which is revolutionary, which will change the game, which will set it a step above everyone else again. So at one point, old school was the game that everybody wanted to be. This is, I mean, you look at, you look at streaming, for example. When we first started off, we did stuff that everybody was scared to do. You know, we went out and killed all our players. It's like, why would you even do that? You know, a, a staff account went into the wilderness and killed everybody. <laughs> it's like, huh? Um, but everyone's doing that now. Everyone's doing. I mean, you look at you look at the the company Q and As that come out from developers. They're following the stuff that we did back when we first started doing it. People are catching up, and they've now surpassed us with what was surpassed us surpassed old school with what it does, and it's leaving old school behind. And that's that. That to me is heartbreaking. Um, but yeah. Anyway, and, there you go. So, uh, in the inverse, is there anything that passed the poll that you, yeah. in retrospect, regret? There was one one thing which made me realise that I didn't understand the game anymore, and that was uh, when Shift Click Drop passed the poll. Wow. Okay. That I think was a time when I was like, "That's it. I'm I'm not in touch with what the community want anymore," um, because my understanding was always that was 
almost like the difficult part of the game that kept the balance of all the other things in the game. Um, I sat there and I was like, I can't believe it. And it passed overwhelmingly as well. I was like, I can't believe how out of touch I must be. And that made me think that, you know, I shouldn't rely on what I believed anymore. That's when I needed to start relying more on what the community managers were telling me, um, what the other team people were telling me. And I don't know if that was the right thing or a mistake to do, whether I should have stuck to my guns and said, look, I don't care whether it passed the poll, it's not going in. Um, but that, that's 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 when the game changed for me because that was the fundamental time where where it was like that that is something that everybody complained about. Everybody wanted that changed, but that is what balanced the entire game. You have the pleasure, you have the pain. You take away the pain, you only have pleasure. That pleasure becomes less important, less good, less pleasurable. You know, you it's. I mean, I can't remember who said it, but years ago, it's you know, you can't have the concept of good if you don't have the concept of evil to balance it against. Um, because if everything was good all the time, it wouldn't feel any different. And that's that 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 was the one thing that really sort of changed changed it for me. And I was like, mm, am I that out of touch? Wow. Okay. Um. So, uh, final question. Didn't expect on... that one, did you? I mean, I can <laughs> I can tell they didn't expect it. I wasn't expecting that one. I have to say. Um. So, final one on the polling system uh, in regards to the polling uh, system. Right, fascinating thing, actually, um, from Hegemon Locke. He says he wants the tool belt because I'm fed up with wasted time. Now, I agree with you there. I think stuff that was completely invaluable and was a waste of time and frustration, I agree with. Them. I'd love to have the tool belt in there because forgetting, I mean, forgetting your spade, that's just a frustration. Um, dropping is a function. It's, it's just so different. And I, I, I tried to get it in with. Um, what was it called? That quest, that 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 skill. What was it called? The skill which was slayer, but for skilling artisan. That was it. That you could make your own tool belt, and you would level up your tool belt, put more tools in it, which I thought was really quite. Do you cool, know? But, do you not know, feel that yeah. tool belt kind of like? So you mentioned shift click, and you felt like kind of fundamentally changed uh, the gameplay. Do you not feel like a tool belt would do that though? No, because the, the difference is shift clicking was. I have all this stuff in my inventory. I drop it on the floor. Okay, that makes sense. A tool belt is, if I had a belt I could put things on, then it would just make my life a little bit easier. And it's about forgetting stuff. You know, you go on a quest, I want to take six items with me. Um, why can't I have a belt that I could just hang it off? Because that seems a completely logical thing to be able to do. And, uh, yeah. Okay. But... So, a final one on the polling system topic. Do Ooh. you think... Okay. Soap says I can't even oh. drop properly with shift click, so it didn't even bloody help me. <laughs> um, so, final one on the polling system topic. Do you think, looking back on this, 75% is the right threshold when it comes to questions? Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I've... Uh... What, what's not past a poll? I mean, there's there's... there's... If you look at everything, other than the, the thing that I mentioned about, which I think is a more fundamental thing rather than rather than um, a threshold being an issue, um, there's nothing that's not passed a poll or has passed a poll which has caused any damage one way or the other. Um, so I think it's right. I think plenty passes a poll. Cool. Um, okay. So I want to talk about... Hmm, let's look at my little topic list. Let's go on to dead man mode. Let's go on to creation of dead man mode. And let's get into mm. obviously the pressures that come with running something like Dead Man Mode, and oh. any st any stories you want to share yeah. about Dead Man Mode. So uh, talk to me about how Dead Man Mode came about. How was it created? So Dead Man Mode, that was um, so I used to love PvP in back in sort of you know two thousand four, five, six, seven, um, and the way I used to PvP back then is would you get your clan together, you'd go walking around the wilderness. And if you saw a white dot in the wilderness, you would absolutely crap yourself. Because, you know, if you lost your stuff, you're at the level back then that if you lost your set of rune, it was significant. And this, your heart was pumping the entire time going around it. There's this excitement that was created. And I wanted to create that excitement throughout the entire game. And it was all about, it was, the whole thing was built around that one emotion of, of, you know, panic, loss, uh, gain, you know, that, that entire 
moment of 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 uh, engagement, and that 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 was what Dead Man Mode was all about. And the way it sort of I approached it was I looked at it and I was like, right, okay, you need to lose everything to create that excitement now, knowing how the community is, um, knowing how easy it is to um, re uh, get your items back again. What people PvP with is you know they're, they're happy to lose this stuff now. It's changed. So what we need to do is make sure when they die, they lose everything. So what can they lose? Number one, they can lose their items that they've got on them. Absolutely gone. You know, anything you've got on you, you've lost. What about XP? What if we get rid of XP as well? Allow them to drop and lose XP, which was a massive technical problem to overcome, <laughs> but we did. Um, they didn't like me when I suggested that. See, Ash's eyes were just like, what the fuck have you asked for? <laughs> <laughs> um, then it was like, well, can't we raid their banks as well? Which is also a what the fuck you just asked for. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, how do how do we make that? So, so you kill somebody, uh, you take a bunch of, or you, they lose a bunch of their XP, and then you go and uh, raid their banks, and it's like that creates this big feeling of loss. Um, and it's like, well, how do we replace that with you know that feeling of of you know gain? Because you need a balanced feeling of gain with it as well. And that was again. That was that was also helped with the um, um, because the other thing was you'd lose the first iteration was you'd lose your bank, so you'd lose all your items, you'd lose your bank, you'd lose all your XP, you would set back basically to level three again. And uh, of course, the first thing I was like, Matt, you can't do that. That's just crazy. You know, if somebody could be playing for a hundred hours, they lose everything. And sort of my approach was, well, that being able to stand up there and say, and this was backed up um, later on when we released Hardcore Iron Man was if you've put all this gain into it to lose everything, that's such a major story that that gets, what gets people excited. Um, but they convinced me to dumb it down a bit. They're a lot nicer than I am. And um, so I, uh, I, I said, uh, okay, they only lose some of the stuff out of their bank, but then the balance was the other person's got to get the stuff out of the bank, so there is a massive reward from it as well. And that's, that's basically how it came about. And uh, so we pitched it on a, um, or I pitched it on a, a live stream. And I said, no, this is an idea I've had. Um, I think it works like this. And this is all, you know, the other side of it. And this is how I see it all working together. And uh, to make sort of the, the other big bonus of it was obviously the huge XP gain. So I think it's plus 20 times XP. Um, and then somebody in chat, as I was just reading the chat, as everybody was going nuts over it, said, I should call it dead man mode. And I was like, well, that's the name for it right there. So that's where the dead man mode came from, was just somebody. I, I had no idea who this guy was. What was it originally called, if you remember? Uh, sorry? Did you have a name for it back then? I didn't even have a name for it, no. No, there's no <laughs> name for it. Nothing. It was just a concept, and I pitched it on a, on a stream. You know, just completely unplanned, because I'd already been thinking about how I could do this thing. And uh, we haven't planned to pitch it on the stream, so I said it, and it just went... <laughs> it went absolutely, um, uh, absolutely nuts. And uh, then somebody just said, "Oh, you should call it Dead Man Mode." And I have no—I wish I really wish I knew who that guy was, just so I could say thank you because Dead Man was just such a perfect name for it. Well, maybe he's watching, so there we go. That's a that that crossed, didn't get across that way. Um, and uh, and that's 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 what happened, and you know, it just just went nuts from there. So, um, but actually, before we go into like Dead Man, the events themselves. Um, you mentioned obviously when you brought up the idea of being able to go through someone's bank and so on. It was it sounded crazy to do. Back then, was there anything that technically limited you that you wanted to do in old school? Um, clan system. Always wanted a clan system. Um, and actually worked around it. I mean. I've always been a great believer as the limitations we have. I, I drilled this into the team over and over again is the word impossible should never be used. It's always possible or very, very difficult, you know, um, but there's no such thing as impossible. We had control over the entire game and, um, you know, we, we, we could do anything that we wanted to and we could, um, but it's just some of it took a huge amount of time to do it. But I don't think there's anything that, I mean, everything that we tried to do, we found solutions for, um, there's very little that, that we couldn't get done, in all honesty, because that's the mentality we had as a group of people. It was like, how do we make this work? It's not a what's getting in the way of it. It's how do we make this work? And I found that, you know, with, with some people, it was a case of you just had to leave them that time to come to a conclusion. You could, and one of the great stories I have was, um, uh, I don't know if you remember our head of technology, Phil. 
Oh yes. Currently yep. working. Yep. Currently working with um, uh, over with uh, Gerhard, I think, at the moment. Yep. Um, and he was always somebody that. Maud Bilby, I believe. That's right. Yeah. Um, and that was always somebody that um, uh, you had to approach in a certain way because if you asked for anything, the answer was always no. That's not possible. So the way we sort of we approached approached him was right. Okay. First thing we'll do is I will go over to him and uh, say. Uh, I'm going to send you an email about this subject. So he was pre prepared for the email. Um, I then sent him a, uh, uh, oh, I've got a brilliant story about Gerhard. Don't let me forget this one. This is brilliant. Um, yeah, don't let me forget this story about Gerhard. It's hilarious. On um, the 15th anniversary. Um, As in the literal uh, 15th anniversary or the documentary? 15th anniversary okay. event, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, my goodness. I remember that. Too. I remember walking around with a mobile phone trying to stream on... Uh, Periscope. Oh my god, that was that was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, got Periscope. Um, so yeah, so we, so yeah, so we send it. So I'll, I'll go over and talk to him. Say, I'm going to send you an email. I'll then send him an email. So I'm going to invite you to a meeting tomorrow um, about. Or tomorrow, I'm going to invite you to a meeting about this subject. Here are the details. I then invite him to a meeting in about three days' time. The next day, with all the details of it again. Then we'd have the meeting, and then we get the result that we wanted. That was the process we went through. Um, and uh, it was it was always tough, uh, but we usually got what we wanted at the end of it. And then um, one situation was um, we decided that we wanted old school to go free to play, and uh, Phil was the guy who uh, was going to make this happen. You know, he he was the one who had the information on whether it was possible to make old school free to play. So uh, I was in in a meeting with uh, Neil and uh, Phil uh, Mansell as well, who was the CEO, um, and he said uh, you can go speak to. The Phil. And I was like, oh, cheers, buddy. Appreciate that. <laughs> Knowing full well that I couldn't go through this process because the CEO of the company wanted the information pretty quick. So I was like, okay, I've got to do this now. So I sort of went up to him and said, uh, Phil, I want to make the game free to play. Can you make it free to play for me, please? <laughs> it's a little, it's a little barrage of, of, of hate that was going to hit me. And he just went, hmm. <laughs> Done. What? <laughs> it took him about what? thirty seconds to actually do it. Oh my goodness! Oh, crazy, isn't it? Anyway, uh, that's by the by. Uh, what, what were we talking about? Uh, we're, um, oh my goodness! Uh, chat, help us. Uh, we were on Dead Man, but I was—I went on to something else. I can't remember why. I deviated. Uh, we were all on Dead Man. I, I, someone said MMG. You mentioned about MMG. Oh yeah, MMG story. Uh, um, uh, so. Um, Old school was a runaway success um, after we got it working. It was it was a huge huge up boost for the company. Um, ended up with more members than RuneScape, and it, it turned into a, a, the major part of the company uh, revenue wise. And at the fifteenth anniversary, Mark Gerhard had obviously lost uh, lost left the company, and uh, we're sitting there, and he, he comes up to me and he goes, uh, "Matt, Matt, you saved Jagex," and I'm like, "What?" I was like, I appreciate you saying that. That was really nice of you. I don't think I did, but, you know, thanks anyway. And, uh, you know, what I realised after he left is what I should have said. Yeah, well, somebody had to make up for the massive fuck-up that was Transforms Universe, didn't they? Yeah. Um, but I never actually said that, but there we go. I just wish I had. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, Matt, Jesus Christ, what are you doing to me here? Jesus. That's all right. Hasbro don't care. <laughs> Actual, uh, yeah. literal mad lads, as they say. <laughs> Good lord. Um, so we're yeah. talking about Dead Man, yeah. and we went into this thing about. Yeah, Phil. I, I, brought, I brought up technical. Uh, oh, technical stuff we were talking about, weren't we? Yes. So, yeah, technical difficulties. No, no, it wasn't. We worked around it all the time. So, Dead Man, let's go into. Um, first of all, Dead Man 1. Um, mm -hmm. Anything you remember from Dead Man 1? Uh, Dead Man 1, I should say. From, oh, God, um, Dead Man 1, the office got DDoS, didn't it? I believe so, yeah. I remember that very yeah, well. So we gave up and went to the pub and got drunk instead. That <laughs> <laughs> was Dead Man Wine. It's like, who's going down the pub? Yeah, all right, I can't. So we got down the pub and just got drunk. I think it was me, um, uh, Chris, Archie. Um, Ian Spam was there. I think Boaty was there as well. Uh, I think uh, he could even skill specs as well. We just went down the pub and got drunk. <laughs> Afterwards, it's like, well, let's give up on this. Office being DDoSed offline, we can't do anything about it. Right, let's go. Oh dear. Uh, okay, so that's that's memories. That's memories of Dead Man One. Yeah. 
So yep. the second one, we did it from um, a TV studio in Norwich. Was this the TV studio next to Jeremy Kyle? Is that correct? This was this was in Jeremy Kyle's studio. Yeah, in the studio that filmed Jeremy yeah, Kyle. The actual, the actual studio for Jeremy Kyle and Soccer Sunday. Oh, there you go. We actually had the Soccer Sunday table. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Hello, Amazing. Crazy. Oh, my for God. For anybody who's not in the UK, Jeremy Kyle is like Jerry Springer. Well, except so he's been taken off that, yeah, yeah, taken yeah. off there for being bad, isn't he? Very good. Um, <laughs> so, wow. So, uh, so that, that, that was those days. That was an absolute uh, technological failure. Very difficult to do, but um, uh, we got it done. And the, I, I remember talking to ESL very early on when we were doing Dead Man. We realised it had legs. We knew it could do something, um, and we wanted to. Uh, I wanted to get some advice from from how to do these sort of events, and so I got in touch with ESL and sort of sat down with their managing director and, and sort of said, you know, "How do you actually do a competitive event?" And the one thing that always stuck to me stuck with me was, um, "You get to the end, no matter what. You get to the end, you get yourself a result." If you think about any any event, uh, any sporting event around the world, they get to the end of it, no matter what. Um, whether it's cricket, whether it's football, whether it's rugby, whether it's American football, games are just not abandoned. You now, you look at the top flight games, you look at the, the proper way of doing stuff, stuff is just not abandoned. They get to the result at the end, and no matter how difficult it is. And that's the one sort of thing that I, the mantra that I always had was no matter what happened, we get to results. Short of catastrophe, um, where it'd be more dangerous not to, we get to the end. Um, and uh, we did on, I think on every single one, we got to the end. And a lot of the time it was me standing there alone, trying to get the team towards the end. The very um, last one, everybody wanted to abandon it. And I, I still sit there and think, if we'd have ever at one point got halfway through a final and said, no, it's not working, we give up, that would have been the worst thing we could possibly do. Um, and we made every mistake under the sun. Absolutely. But then we were doing something that nobody else had ever done on technology that was you know, 15 years old. Um, of course, every mistake was going to happen. You know, you couldn't imagine how it was going to work. Um, and then you look at how every other company did it, and they made every mistake under the sun as well. You look at the first lot of uh, League of Legends stuff. They took about thirty different events to get to one that actually went well. Yeah, we like, had thirteen. They had, um, I think, it was season two of the World Championships. They had a match that actually didn't finish for about seven or eight hours. But it goes back to your point of powering through, like to make sure you get to that result at the very end. Yeah, like if I, remember, exactly. I think I, re- I think it was season two or season three, one of them. Um, right? Uh, was Dead Man? Which one? I have to bring it up. The Wooks eating through the fog mm. moment in Dead Man. What was take me through if you can timeline of when it was first noticed this happened, and then the steps that followed after that. Um, so I think we were at the studio in Leicester at the time. I think no, no, we were. This is the difficult thing. We were in San Diego, so we, this is the one we were doing live from uh, TwitchCon. Um. And what the what we'd done beforehand is because the guy before won by eating through the, um, I think it was you never learn. I think it was, who ate through the the. Um, the fog. Who ate through the fog? Yeah, um, and um, I was like, right, okay, well, we can't let that happen again. So it was quite widely known that we were going to put stuff in place to stop that from happening. So to deliberately do something to bypass that was just you know that's obviously cheating. You know, we've gone out there quite publicly said you shouldn't be able to do this, but somebody still found out um, a way of doing it, and uh, and that was that that was you know it was bug abuse, you know, quite quite clearly. So obviously uh, we went and killed him. The only way to get him out of the game before we got to the final was um, was to send somebody to go and kill him. Unfortunately, at that exact moment that um, and it was it was no one's. It wasn't. It wasn't um, anyone's fault. Um, we sent Ash to go and kill the guy. Um, so it wasn't Ash. Didn't you know? It wasn't Ash that went and killed him. It was. It was uh, his decision to go and kill him. It was as a group. That's what we decided. Ash was the one who was in the best position to go and actually do the act to to kill him and remove him out of the game. The camera, boom, 
went onto it. <laughs> it was just really bad timing. Had that have not happened, very few people would have known. It wouldn't have been. But do, do, you, stop, stop first, yeah. do, do, do you not think maybe like because obviously I believe Wooks was recording at his point of view at the time. You mentioned it was if it wasn't shown on stream, it might not have been as known. But if he had uploaded it, do you not feel like it would have had a reaction anyway? Yeah, it could have been. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, so, and actually while we're on that topic, when it comes to those decisions, you decide it as a collaborative team. Is that correct? Hmm. Yeah. So those decisions are, what should we do? We're all in communication at the same time as well. What should we do? We should do this, right? I'll go do it. Okay. Carry on. Um, it was just bad timing. Okay. So, uh, to so talk to me about the fallout of that event. And uh, like, was it, I imagine, quite difficult to manage because obviously they had seen this on stream, the viewers, they then yeah. uh, caused, like, they made their posts saying, why did this happen and so on. So how difficult was that to manage? Yeah, so we didn't, we didn't, we didn't know what had happened. So we'd, we'd done it, we'd seen it, we'd done blah, 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 blah. Uh, the event had finished because we were in a um, different place working. We, it wasn't an event purely for Dead Man. This is when that was the last event we did at another big event. Every other event was purely Dead Man events. Um, because we didn't have the support beyond the end of the show, because we we're on a public stage, which other people wanted to use afterwards. Um, I met Tim the Tap Man before going on that. That was really cool. Uh, <laughs> before going on the stage, I got to shake his hands and everything. It was great. Um, um, yeah, so uh, we did uh, did that, and um, uh, so we, we thought it was done. It was like, right, okay, we've got a bit of cleaning up to do, but that can wait a few hours because one thing that you do with the community is if you go out straight away and talk about something, it usually gets ignored. So there is no point in um, uh, going out there and reacting to things almost immediately as soon as they happen. You've got to give the time for people to get that anguish out of their system so they're ready to listen. So if you're talking and people aren't ready to listen, there's no point in doing it. Um, and then we were sat in a, we were sat with um, our account manager from Twitch, uh, in a Mexican restaurant, really rubbish food, if I remember rightly. <laughs> uh, but it came through that Ash had paid Wooks 10k. It's like what? How did you hear this? Know. Was this was this player talk or was this someone who? Yeah, this, you? This, was, this was through um, Reddit. And it's like no, that can't have happened. That's that's rubbish. So we called it, and it's like no, it looks like it's happened. So I messaged Ash. Said, did you just pay him 10k? He's like, yeah, I thought I was doing the right thing. So that was actually Ash's money. That was Ash's money. Yeah. Wow. Oh my I sit there and think, you know, yeah, I, th I sit there and I think, no, this is, this is, you know, a massive gesture from Ash. It's like, I think it's a crazy gesture. I like, I don't know quite how. Um, and I did try and get his money back from him for him, but because you know, I thought, you know, you can't let let that go on. Um, but I wasn't allowed to, so you know, that's that's that out of the window. Um, um, but it's like. The, the, what really lowered, um, like I say, this is going to put me into a really bad light. What really lowered my opinion of Wooks is that he bloody accepted it. I'm like, did, is, did, is there did, no sort of emotional? Did Wooks know it was Ash's money? That's the that's well, the important nothing. question here. I, I would I would imagine so. I mean, it depends on how Ash approached it, though, right? Oh yeah, I, don't, I mean, I wasn't part of that conversation, but I sit there and I think it's like, I mean, even as a person, it's like. In your right mind, someone's going to give you ten grand, and someone's messaging you through the game to ask you bank details to send the money to, and you're like, that, "That's not right." And it's like, oh, I don't know. It, it just struck me as everybody down down the road just just made a mistake that day. Um, and yeah. I, I guess it I guess it cr creates a problem because it then looks like he's gone against Jagex, right? So when I saw that, because I was actually staying awake and watching it, and I, you know, I had to look on the Reddit, and I was fascinated because of like just seeing what happened. And then I looked at it, and I thought, like, is there like a clash now, like that comes of it? So was there? I presume there was a clash of heads in regards to Jagex and also Ash. No, so, so, I mean, looking back at it, and I sort of look, it's, it's a lot easier to look back in the cold light of day. And the one thing I always try and do myself is I look up the fault in me before I look at the fault in anybody else. And I sit there and I think, right, okay, the it clearly was wrong. As an individual, you shouldn't be paying out that amount of money. Um, it, 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 it's crazy. 
Um, and uh, the one thing I will always say about Ash is his heart is always in the right place. Of course, absolutely. There was, there was, there was never any doubt about that. And what I feel really bad about is, you know, he felt isolated at that time, and that was my fault. I mean, he shouldn't have felt isolated at that time. And once we understood that, we put in places things to to, to solve that. Um, and like I said, I spoke to my boss about getting him his money back because I thought it was very wrong, and we should at least give him his money back. But I wasn't wasn't allowed to do that, so I was like, well. Yeah, it's it, it it's sucks a, a bit. But, it's incredible. Yeah, like, I mean, first of all, uh, like, I, I wish I could just throw away ten grand like that. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> I absolutely wouldn't be able to do that. But I mean, you know, I I understand the gesture absolutely, hundred mm. percent. Like, I get it. It's just I can only imagine the um, initial awkwardness for Ash, obviously, then going mm. in the next day, and then obviously feeling like. He was on his own, so yeah, I I can I can understand that. Yeah, but no, we, we we sorted it out and we moved on from it, and you know, but I mean, again, a big a big thing that I think was wrong is we didn't give him his money back. I think that was yeah. Um, uh, and to be fair for Ash, he didn't he didn't expect it back, so I shouldn't be. I mean, yeah, he, he didn't expect it back, so. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the DMs he had works. I remember it saying that like he was just doing it because he didn't expect Jagex budget to cover it and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's I mean it's a testament to Ash in my opinion, and like you mentioned, it always has this, like always is coming from the yeah. right place. So you know you can't fault that at all. Um, so okay, that was fascinating. Um, I thought it was always like I thought it'd be interesting to get a perspective from that. So, uh, that was uh one of the dead man's. Is there anything else dead man mode or dead man events? that stand out to you uh, in regards to the events themselves, the running of it, and so on and so forth. We were so close with so many cool things with Deadman. It was, uh, the amount of stuff we tried to do with it, which we almost got over the line but didn't quite. We almost got it onto BBC TV. Um, as in which would on, have been the on, first, on the channel? As in on BBC Three, yeah. Wow. As that in the first ever, almost got it as the first ever broadcast um, eSports event on British TV. Um, almost. These, these, these are the near misses we had from it. And then I, I, Gfinity came in on Sky Sports, I believe, with yeah, Formula One yeah. and stuff. And, wow. um, and I mean, I, I felt that I didn't have the support to drive some of this stuff forward um, to make it happen. There certainly wasn't the budget there. The budget was always done on a shoestring, but um, yeah, that's just part of business, really. Um, almost built a castle in Los Angeles. Almost built a castle. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Is that nuts? I had the budget, I had it all signed off, and then it just fell at the final hurdle to build a castle to do an build a castle, do an esports event inside a castle for Dead Man in Los Angeles. I remember the set, so <laughs> I had the opportunity to go to this event because there was uh well, in other words, it just needed help and you know, my manager mm. said put out a message to the team and it was like you know, you uh, like there's this option to go in. It's only one open to help out, and I was always happy. Like I always wanted to help out in any way I could. So you know, I had this opportunity to go to LA. You know, I went um, through uh, with you, with Ian, with Elliot, I believe. Well, they asked me who I wanted, and I put I said you. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we we went to you know LA, and that was obviously the first time I really got to know you on a personal level, just from obviously stories and everything else that came from it. So you know that was really good fun. I enjoyed that. You know a little bit of a taste of Dead Man from uh, a presenting perspective. I enjoyed that big time. The set actually was pretty amazing. I didn't realize there would have been a castle, but the set itself was pretty yeah. awesome. No, this was this was a different one. To oh, it's a different one. Okay, apologies. This um, was this was custom. This was a custom castle in the center of LA in Beverly Hills. Oh my god! <laughs> like, come on! <laughs> Holy shit! Wow. Three hundred and fifty grand, but I couldn't quite get the money out of the uh, the board. So. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, but yeah, I mean, I absolutely love the uh, the demo event in LA. Like, you know, it's the first time I've ever ever been on a plane. The first time I ever mm. left the UK. It was all new for me. It was all quite. Uh, that was the plane where we had the entire back to ourselves, wasn't it? It was, but like, I could, I couldn't, I, I couldn't focus because I was petrified. Um, yeah, I was craziness. Uh, but I mean, the but fact that was the thing. It's, it's the weirdest plane trip I'd ever been on because. We were on, what was it, a Boeing 767. So this is, you know, five seats in the middle, three mm. seats at the end. This is a huge plane. And we were in the back section of the plane. So we had about 20, 20 uh, rows to ourselves because there was nobody else but us eight people in it. 
So we were all lying across these seats in the middle. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was nice as a, as a first onboarding for flying. It was lovely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the LA uh, that event stands out to me. To be honest with you, that really does um, as just something that was really, really fun to do. You know, I'm glad I had the opportunity to do it. I got to see kind of back. I love seeing behind the scenes of how stuff works. Mm. I love just like sitting back and observing how something like this runs just from like a geeky perspective because I love seeing that stuff. Um, I thought it was really awesome. So, you know, I, I'm proud to say I had a small part in Dead Man, even if it was just presenting. Like, I'm glad to have done that. It was awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, in regards to um, anything, is there anything else story-wise in regards to Dead Man? God, there's so much exciting stuff happening. We almost got it into DreamHack as well. To, um, since the Sweden, dream, the dream hack in Sweden. Yeah, it's the dream hack stage on Sweden. Uh, wow. We had we had we had it ready to be signed, and again didn't get the money out of the board for that. Um, what else did we try and do with it? We tried to get it over to to um, Korea once, but I think that was never going to happen. So yeah, but, yeah, uh, we did we we lots of lots of bits and bobs with it. It was, uh, it was quite cool. What was the panic like then on the last Dead Man? Because we have to talk about it. Uh, obviously, you know, it led to it being re- it reran uh, in the yeah. office. But I mean, what was that? What was it like back then? I mean, it, this I say back then. This was last year, right? So yeah, well, it's not panic. You know, the by that point, what we had in place was a um, um, crisis plan. So we had a plan in place at that point because we'd we'd learned every single time we'd learned from it. We'd done something extra with to, to mitigate all the possible risks. And uh, by the end, we had something called a crisis plan, which which was because one of the things we realized was that when you're in the situation where something's going wrong, there is a huge amount of pressure on people. And and for me, being the one who's leading it, there's a huge amount of pressure on me to write, make the right decision. And when you've got that amount of pressure, you can't guarantee you're going to make the right decision. And one of the most difficult things you can do as an individual is to realize your limitations and say, if this situation happens, I don't trust that I'm going to make that right decision. And no one else is going to make that decision because it's because I'm I'm the lead there. I'm the one who is responsible for it and people look at me to make that right decision. So I need to put give myself as much support as I can prior to the event when my head's clear when um um the the you can think clearly to make that right decision. So we had all these plans of what happens if this happens, what happens if this happens. Um, So the crisis plan was right. Okay. You've got a DDoS. uh, You've lost 10% of your players. What do you do? You do this, you do this, you do this. Is this the situation? Um, It's basically just a flow chart of what you have to do. And the thing you have to be as an individual leading that event and being responsible for that event is you have to be strong enough to follow that chart, no matter what, and people will argue. The last one, I had everybody arguing with me. So this is 20 people arguing with me that we should stop it and cancel it. But the flow chart said, no, we do this next. We do this next. We do this next. And it's, what, it's, it's a really tough thing to do, to go against the consensus of everybody around you, knowing full well that I'm going to trust this flow chart because we did this when our heads were cool. We did this when we sat in a room together and said, what happens when this situation goes on? it's tough it takes a lot of strength to be able to to go against everybody wanting to do something else um and and you've got the backup of saying we're going to make this decision because when we weren't under pressure when we weren't stressed when um we didn't think the world was falling around around us this is what we thought was the right decision and back then we could make a better decision than we can right now and that's why we kept on going and we kept on going and we kept on going until we got to that end result and we got that end result. And afterwards, then we can make another cool decision, which is let's run it again. And that is not something we could, we should have made in that moment when you've got 100,000 people watching you. You've got every member of staff in the building telling you to stop, uh, telling you something that you something opposed to what you're doing. Um, I remember the Slack chat, actually. I remember... I can't remember why I was in there, but I remember it. Um, I, it was it was obviously chaos because these are situations that you know you got you have to expect just in case. But obviously emotions run high, and obviously emotions can lead to impulse decisions like potentially cancelling it. So yeah, I totally get that. 
Um, but it's, it's 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 one of the toughest things you can do as a leader of people is is to go against what everybody else thinks. But that's when you have to show your leadership to drag them through it. And we got to the end and we got a result and uh, it finished. I think had we have stopped it halfway through, um, I think that would have been worse for us at that point. I don't know what the chat think, if they, they, they believe that or not. It'd be interesting it, to hear what they think. be interested say. to know what they think. Yeah. Because um, I don't like to pretend that I'm right 100% of the time. Maybe just sort of 92.5% uh, <laughs> of the time. <laughs> Stopping it. No, so, someone said, I agree. Stopping it would have killed the entire flow of the event. Stopping it would always be terrible. I agree. I mean, there you go. I mean, just from the initial chat. To be fair, I did emotionally put them into a position where they couldn't disagree with me. So, you know. So, um, Jed Man. I think... Talk about Jed. Everybody wants to know about Jed. Floor Jules. Oh, wow, fucking Jed. Yeah. So, um, uh, what happened with Jed? Oh, boy. So, uh, okay, so I got a call from the police. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, end of last year, so about November last year. And I said, hey, is that Matt Kemp? And I was like, yes, that's me. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Inspector, whatever my name is, phone in from, um, started off well, yeah, absolutely, um, phone in from uh, Cambridgeshire Constabulary. Uh, I want to talk to you about Jed Sanderson. I was like, okay, yeah, okay, fair enough. And uh, this is after I've left Jagex, so I'm quite free to talk about all this, which is quite cool. Oh, um, okay. Okay. And um, and I was like, okay, yeah, well, what can I help you with? It's like, well, I understand. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Jed and what's been going on. It's like, well, I was involved in all the, the investigations for it, of what happened. And it's like, yeah, my understanding is you ran the first investigations into into him um, before uh, before he, he he left Jagex. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so we spoke about that for a bit because obviously the investigations that I led were um, all the complaints that Rotten made against him, or not Rot, the other company, the other clans, um, had made against him about cheating and leaking IPs and what have you. And I ran all those investigations. And as I put out publicly, there's never any evidence we stand behind him 100%. Um, because, Wasn't you know, front, when I ran the investigation. I believe it was. Frontline? Yeah, that's it. Frontline. Yeah, yeah that's the guys. Um, because I could, yeah, false frontline that, that lot. Because there was no evidence. And, you know, we, we dug and we dug and we dug. <laughs> And we could find no evidence. And in the UK, you can't just fire somebody without evidence. Um, you have to have proof that, that wrongdoing is going. And you look at it and you think, right, this is a individual in the team. Um, there's all these accusations coming in. There's no proof that anything happened. So we publicly go out and say, no, this is not happening. We can't find any proof of it whatsoever. Um, and then obviously he gets fired for doing stuff which um, uh, is very bad. Um, I don't know. So I can't remember what the the yeah I mean the community know what happened they they he uh, he allowed accounts to be hijacked and stuff stolen off them um, so so it was it was it was a case that you know afterwards it was like a case of like you know I actually feel really angry at Jed because I stood behind him when all these accusations were coming, in fact, I stood in front of him when all these accusations were coming in and said, no, we back this guy. Uh, we've done everything. I interviewed him. Um, he assured me nothing was going on. I can't obviously prove that there wasn't anything going on, but it's probable that there probably was. Um, and I backed him 100%. I went out publicly and said, this guy's doing nothing wrong. Get off his back um, and stop it. But something probably was going on back then. So I feel sort of personally angry. Well, I personally backed him up. And, uh, you know, the, when the investigations were going on, I sort of said to my boss who was running the investigation into uh, the, the final thing that got him uh, fired. Um, I said, you know, make sure you let him know how absolutely pissed off I am with him. Um, because, quite frankly, I went, I went, stuck my neck out to protect him and look after him, and he threw that right back in my face. And personally, I was like, you know, what the hell are you playing at? And it's lucky I didn't see him at RuneFest. Well, I think I would have I would have had words. Um, I'm not a violent person. Others in the company were back then, <laughs> from what I've heard, but there we go. Oh, boy. Oh, come on. There's a community now about that as well. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so it's like uh, that, that, really, that really wound me up. And then sort of some of the stories that have come out, which were... 
he went onto people's accounts, and not only did they steal their items, they dropped their untradeables. Yeah. And you think, come on, stealing items, make money. I can understand that. I don't agree with it, but I can understand it. But just doing something nasty like that, nah. That's just that's just just nasty. Um, that's just wrong. So um, I, I don't want to be the person to stir the pot, but you mentioned you had a call um, from the police. Oh yeah, for police. Yeah, so, so so we sort of went through, and and one of the questions they asked me was because um, because I did the investigation, I couldn't find any proof, and uh, I said to the police, you know, I was talking to to one of the guys I worked with at the time, and uh, the guy asked me, "Do you trust him?" And I said, "Not as far as I could throw him." And the police said, "Well, why, why did you think that?" And I was like, "Well, you know, there is no smoke without fire, so something has gone on, um, and I don't know what it is. So he's not being truthful with me about that." Um, but equally, he's so isolated within the company at the time. He, there were situations where, um, uh, where his managers were telling him to do stuff, and he deliberately wasn't doing it. And there's was, there's was this sort of this build up of, of things that were going on, which we like. There's something happening, and it sort of de degrades your trust in somebody. And um, I, I feel a bit bad that that it only got the situation. It wasn't spotted earlier because. Looking back at it now, there are clear signs that something weird was going on and something proper had to happen. Um, and it's like, you know, that's, that's, we, we should have spotted it beforehand and we didn't. Um, most of his code for mobile had to be rewritten because it was terrible. Um, that's just an aside. Um, <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ash and Ed wrote, rewrote most of it, I think. Um, so you know all the stuff he was doing for for weeks just was it just wasn't managed properly. Um, I wasn't his manager back then, but you know I should have been able to spot that and and made that work. Um, but yeah, so I was just talking to the police, and I remember sort of signing off the police saying, "Look, if you if you find him, make sure you nail him because you know it it, it was significant significant bad things happened off the back of this and." Uh, there needs some responsibility needs to be added to it. But I was I was also talking to a uh, friend of his a few weeks later, and uh, I bumped into a friend of his, and we were chatting about it. And he was saying how Jed's had to change his name, um, oh not my twice, God. just his first and his last name. Um, he's had his bank accounts frozen by the police. What the fuck is this stream? Um, what is going I'm talking about interesting stuff, <laughs> and. Um, and uh, because because of the money he's made from it, which is illegal, and it's probably the tax man. I would. I mean, I've always believed that if you want to go after people in real world trade, you tell the tax man. You don't tell the policeman because the tax man will get him. Um, so yeah. But anyway, those last two rumours. They could be wrong, but I trust the guy who told me. So. If you're wondering why my Facebook is going off right now, stream. <laughs> that's my wife, as you can imagine. <laughs> She's probably like, "What the hell's going on?" Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a bit shook. I won't lie. Yeah. Absolutely, what the actual hell? There's few people in this world that I've met where I think I think that they are not nice people. But knowing what I know, he is one of them. I mean, I mean the worst thing is as well. He was having trouble with his bloody landlord at one point. And his landlord was breaking the law, and I was like, "Look, I'll go round and sort out your landlord if you want. You know, it's, it's not a problem. I'm not not physically sort him out, but just go round. Like, if you keep messing with him, I'm going to get our house lawyers on it, and you're not going to have a, a you're not going to be a landlord any longer. And um, you know, that, that was the sort of support I was giving the guy, cause just to just to make him feel comfortable and happy to work with us. And it's like right back in your face. It's like that. I'm I'm still I won't lie. I'm, I'm reeling a little bit. I was not prepared for where this was going to be going. Unbelievable! Um, wow. So uh, there you go. That's a that's one hell of a it's one hell of a um, explosive piece of content right there. That's for sure. Now we'll wait for uh, turn that into a YouTube video. Now, now we'll wait for uh, <laughs> people on Reddit and YouTube to pick that one up. My goodness! I don't um, think there's anything secret about that. That's that's and wow. the really interesting thing is if he does get publicly prosecuted, that all becomes public information. So if he is prosecuted, everybody will know all the details because that's, that's that's the way the law works in this country. So, um, 
Wow. Uh, so let's take. I mean, is there anything you see in chat right now, Matt? You want to uh, put a go on to? Otherwise, I'll go back onto my topic list. <laughs> Why have I scared you a bit, Sean? Yeah, I'm not scared. I mean, no, it's not even scared. It's more like I'm just I, I, honestly every. I don't really know much about that. All I remember is that I saw a video from Frontline, but I don't know the story. But I didn't realize it turned into like I, I don't even have to compare it. But it sounds like there could be a Netflix documentary on this for God's sake. Like Jesus <laughs> Christ, man! <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, Bear Hero, Bear Hero, we already covered Reach earlier on. So if you missed that, then feel free to watch the stream back. Um, welcome, I, welcome to my world, mate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I remember you mentioning um, Silent Core, but I don't know if you want to if you want to mm. talk about that. It's up to you. Silent Core. So I don't, it was very early on in old school, wasn't he? Silent Core. Um, yeah. This was. He was also called Dan. This is twenty fourteen. This is twenty fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think I don't know the exact details of why he got let go, but I think it was explained to me once that uh, he had been dodging bullets for a while. Um, I believe he was even botting in the office, which was quite interesting. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> this is one of the rumours I heard. I don't know how true it is, but you know that's what I was told. He was botting in the office, um, <laughs> which was an interesting thing. Uh, a shame Dan's not on here to actually have a chat with about it because that would be quite entertaining. I mean, I have actually. a feeling that. Um... Again, I, I have a feeling that there's going to be some aftermath in from this stream um, <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. Um, yeah. I, again, it's just cra like it's crazy the stuff that I find out. Like it just it kind of highlights to me that I was very secluded in what I did at Jagex because I never really heard about anything. So it's mm. kind of it's kind of highlighted to me right now, to be honest with you. Um, it, is, it is the sort of stuff that you can you have to deal with as a leader. There are individuals who. I, it's a really difficult thing when you when you are a player that comes into Jagex, um, because you get this. And I'm trying to think how it happened. We had a. I remember having a conversation with the community team about how do we measure, um, how people will react to moving from player to a J mod, because the emotions you get and the the power you get over individuals is intoxicating at times. There's so many people I've seen that have come in as players and have made the absolute complete wrong decisions because they feel they're untouchable, they've got ultimate power over other players. Um, I mean, we've had people from QA that come in and abuse bugs and get fired. There's all sorts of stuff. And it is it comes from this idolization of, you know, this is what Jagex is. It's this, this wonderful thing where you become a god. And then you get this God syndrome as you join the company. Think you can do anything, get away with anything. And uh, and it, some people just can't cope with it. And that's what's happened. That's that's what will always happen. There'll be more instances of that going on. Um, but I think Jagex is, is much better now at managing it than they, they used to be, certainly. But it's, it's just human nature, I think. Gotcha. Um Okay, uh, I'm gonna I, I, I'm just go back on topics. I mean, so I have topics in relation to uh, Chambers of Zarek. I mean, is there anything from Zarek uh, that comes to mind story wise or anything like that? <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a laugh. That's a good start. Okay. Oh dear. So so um, I I when part of sort of the product manager's job is to come up with a high level um, pitch for what this content is. And uh, so I sort of came up with a pitch for it, and it was like, right, it should be a instance. I mean, I didn't come up with the idea of um, it should be a raid, but I sort of tried to put together what the raid should look like. Um, it should have bosses that do this, and it should have, you know, um, these are the different mechanics that we can use as, as sort of fundamental parts of the the attacks. And uh, most of the most of the actual uh, mechanics for the bosses came from Star Wars Galaxies. I literally <laughs> just ripped them straight out. Of the game. Ironically, this Discord tells me you are currently playing Star Wars Galaxy. Yes. So, uh... <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, it is. It is actually on the screen behind behind you. I'm not actually playing it because um, yeah, 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 it's a bit bit too much intense. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, there's some great heroic instances in there which have some really cool mechanics. And I was like, well, that's a cool mechanic. Let's see if we can get this in game. I just listed a whole bunch of the mechanics, and uh, the guys just developed the content around these mechanics. And I was like, okay, <laughs> carry on. So, uh, so that was quite cool. Um, the key one about getting the three whatever it is, so they 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 um, 
uh, you have to damage them at the same amount each time. And if they get too far from each other, they just replenish their health. That was that was one of the cool things. Vanguards, that's it. Yeah, that was that was one of it. Um, but uh, it was such a cool thing to actually be able to see, you know, something that you love in a different game actually get it put into your game in a different interpretation. And uh, it's such a su such a cool thing to to, to be able to see. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay. Anything else on Zarek, or should we shift over? Um, Zarek's name came out of a website of Latin names, uh, where I was looking for different names. So I went, uh, find me some Latin names, please. <laughs> and this website turned a whole bunch of Latin names. Like, Zarek, he sounds like he should be a bad person. <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think it fits really well, to be fair. Well, there we go. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. There, there's some trivia for the old school wiki page right there for those yeah. guys who want to edit it. Um, um, the, um, the whole history, before um, even Zaya was made, uh, I mapped out the whole history year by year um, into what actually happened all the way through Zaya. And there's still a document um, that they have. I don't know if they stick to it anymore or not. But it basically goes through all the kings um, uh and regencies and everybody else that actually has has ruled Zaya over the time and the key parts of history that go through that. So there's an awful lot more to be uh, to be explored there and a lot more to be filled in and, uh, and backed up. So there's going to be some interesting stuff coming out in the future, I think, on Zaya. Awesome. Some really good storylines. So uh, talk to me about Inferno. Inferno. Oh, that was all Kieran. Kieran did the entire thing for that. He was designed it. He he had the, the the passion for it. I was worried that it was too difficult. And I think we had some conversations about, you know, is this right? But then it all sort of filtered back to the the same thought of how did people perceive um, Jad when that came out and the fight caves, um, fire caves, fire fire whatever it is. Um, well, you would know, right? You've been trying to do it. I've done it. Yeah, yeah there I've we go. It, Jad's, Jad's my bitch now. Um, <laughs> Please quote that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from that, actually, just before we go on to uh, talk about Inferno, uh, what are your thoughts on the very classic meme videos of your incredible clicking skills that uh, I have enjoyed immensely? Uh, that it's become oh, such hilarious, a meme. aren't they? Oh, dear, they're absolutely hilarious. Taking on five Jads and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, I think I think they're they're, they're amazing. Oh dear me! I do love them. I do love them. Ah, yeah, and the, the dropping yeah. technique. There you go. Yep. Oh mm. my goodness! On the way. Why am I saying the meme videos? They're real. Jesus! What am I on about? The problem with that. Okay, the whole problem with that <laughs> dropping thing was I had a, um, I had a Logitech mobile wireless mouse. And it's, I mean, I've got big hands. Okay. I mean, my wife's very pleased about that. Um, but but <laughs> these these. These little mobile mice are about the sort of size of this, so me trying to control them is very difficult. <laughs> I was wondering how long we'd go before you'd eventually sneak something in of some sort. Unbelievable! I see the I see the wines kicking in. That's what she in. said, mate. <laughs> oh dear. Um, okay, uh, Inferno. Where were we? Inferno. So we were talking about Inferno. Basically, all of Kieran's ideas. But I mean, you were worried yeah. that he overscoped in a sense and too difficult. Or... Well, not overscoped. Just made it too difficult. Okay. Um, but then, one of the things sort of I learned over time was was to listen to the people around you. And I have opinions. I have opinions about practically everything in the world. Um, but you need to listen to people around you to know when their opinions are more important than yours. When I was talking to, to, to Kieran about it and saying, you know, I'm worried that this is too difficult for people to do. And when the entire team are saying, no, it's supposed to be difficult. And these are the reasons why that's when you've got to sort of go, okay, your opinions are probably more important than mine right now. So let's go with you guys. And there were multiple times where I sort of held it up in front of the, you know, the senior leadership at Jagex and said, look, my feeling is the same as yours but the entire team are telling me something different and we should listen to that team because they know what they're talking about. And that, that was a, that was a, a game changer for so many things, so many conversations that I had to have. I mean, I mean, I think it's safe to say when you look at it from a viewership on Twitch perspective, it did incredibly well. Um, it yep. was amazing. I remember 
uh, it releasing, and then I was I left the office, and as I was walking downstairs, I could look through the the window into the atrium, and I could see some of the old school guys who had a multi Twitch stream of all the streamers trying to take on um, Inferno, and they were watching it in the atrium on a huge TV, and they were cheering it on. It was so awesome! Like mm. I absolutely oh, loved amazing, that. Amazing, isn't it? Like I it's thought it was amazing incredible. Just to have. Yeah, just to see everybody sitting there watching the players play the content that they made is such an emotional thing to, to happen. And it boils down to, you know, these guys, they put in... Um, it's not a nine-to-five job. I mean, or nine-to-six, as it is in Jagex. Um, it's not a nine-to-six job. They will do nine-to-six, and then they will stay until eight o'clock every night. Um, and then when you come to... to, to so just before it, they'll stay till 10 o'clock every night. And then they'll think... Of, it's not a case that they have to do it. They can release the content by working till six o'clock every night, but there's something extra they can do to make it a little bit better, a little bit better. And that's what they do every single time. They put in that extra time to do that extra thing that makes it a little bit better. And that's what that's what turns the content from being, yeah, it's all right, to content that's really exciting because they put the time in to make it a little bit better. Okay. When I was telling them to do it, they're doing it off their own back. It's, it's like I, the stuff I want to work on, I want to be great. And the way I measure that it's great is because the players are going to tell me that it's great. And as long as that focus stays, then then there's going to, the, the content's going to be good. So clarification, they're not paid to stay to do the extra time, correct? No, no, they, they do, do it off their own back. back. Right. So yeah, was, there, was there ever a concern, because obviously you're essentially in charge of the product itself, was you ever concerned of burnout from staff doing this in this extra time? Yeah, I nearly killed Ash once. Um... <laughs> okay. He took a day off sick after not taking one off for about you know about twelve years. Um, <laughs> so I worked him too hard. Oh god, I remember that was that was somewhat recently, wasn't it? Actually, uh, yeah, yeah, that was quite recent. And uh, that, he didn't have a day off sick for twelve years, yeah. and then, then and, and I, then I, I don't know what project it was, but he took a day off sick, and it was like, wow, I've done something wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean. At the end of the day, I've always I've always seen it from like old school, and as, uh, like I've noticed it more because uh, in my early days at Jagex, I used to stay very late and just like try and get on with stuff. But I always notice like your Ashes or even Kieran and like you know even QA guys because the QA guys like they're not doing it like it's, it's, not, it's like for those guys as well, and that's why I loved is that they were using this time to because they've done their project work for the day, but then they would use it to try and learn more about the game, but also learn about more of the scripting side of things. How does the internal bits of the game work and i absolutely loved that i thought it was awesome exactly yeah um, there is a passion within the old school team and it certainly was when i was there i assume it's still there oh it's i i, I um, get the impression still there for sure like is, with twisted the, and stuff to to make sure they are doing the best thing they possibly can for the players and that's that's the passion that's there and that's 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 such an important part of it and it is key it's not just they're doing the best thing it's for the players and that focus there is is the most important thing. If a player stays centre of everybody's mind, um, then you can't go wrong. Uh, someone's asked, any good Mod Ash stories? I imagine you have a few. I probably do. I don't know if I'm allowed to share them. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> then I talk about people when uh, other than bad people, such as uh, Jed, uh, when they're not around. No, that, well, I mean, if it's a fun story, uh, I, I don't imagine it being a problem, but I guess it depends on what the story is. Well, I'm sure more will come out as we as we talk about more things. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, we're on Inferno. Oh, okay. Fear of Blood. I want to talk to you about Fear of Blood. Um, were you happy with Fear of Blood when you look back on it as a project? Hmm. Am I happy with it? This is the most thought you yes. put into a question, by the way, in this entire stream. Yeah. Like, this is... Uh, <laughs> This is a big one. Yeah, it's got to be a difficult question. Am I happy with it? Um, oh, hi, Pickle. I think so. There's some really, really good things about Theatre of Blood. Um, I remember talking to uh, Mod Ghost while he was um, doing the artwork for it, and there's so much groundbreaking. I mean, it's not groundbreaking, and in, in, so you got a pussycat. Yeah, I've got Pickle just jumping up on, on my yeah, chair. So, so I've got to get all mine. I can just be <laughs> covered by furry animals. Uh, um, eat the cat on stream, apparently, says Mr. Moore. <laughs> just uh, casual, normal, normal things you say, of course. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 
Theatre of Blood. So, so yeah, talking to Mod Ghost about Theatre of Blood, there's a huge amount of groundbreaking um, artwork that went into making it possible, um, which, again, you wouldn't recognise in a different game because, obviously, there's a lot more advanced um, graphic engines than the one that currently runs old-school RuneScape. Um, but there's so much cool stuff that went into it and so much out-of-the-box thinking to make some of the cool things happen, like, such as when... Um, that Lady Verzig just sort of bounces up and down. The actual ripples of her skin and how her stomach goes up and down is all unique stuff that, that never happened before. Um, there's just so much, so much creativity went into to, into the art style and the delivery of the, uh, the 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 animations and and the graphics that went into that is 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 pretty magical and it gets overlooked all the time. She is pretty thick. You're quite right. Uh, Art matters, um, but it was yeah. There's so much, so much passion went into that, and one of the cool things about it as well was that uh, Mod Ghost was involved in the um, law that was behind the stories that went into it. Because one of the things that he felt really passionate about, and it worked really well, was that if he understands why it is the way it is. The actual delivery of it from a from a visual point of view is so much stronger. So he understood why Lady Verzik was the the way she is. Why um, that one with the skinny one with the arms is the way she is, um, whatever they're called, and all the different um, different elements of it. He was part of creating the story to understand the way it worked, so that when he was creating the characters, he could really embody. Um, the story behind that character into what was what was actually being seen on screen, and that is such a such a step beyond what an artist should be doing. An artist should be creating art, as simple as that. But really understanding why you are creating it, why they should do be doing that stuff, is sort of the step beyond. That's why I've always loved uh, Mod Ghost so much. He's you know, yeah, he's one of the absolutely. nicest guys in the world, best hair in the world as well, obviously. Um, but one of the nicest guys in the world who has such a passion for making sure that the stuff he is creating um, is the stuff that the players will really feel embodied with. Um, and I, I remember, I, was, I, I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to because it's it's such a wonderful story. Okay, I, I feel your face uh. go again. <laughs> it's <gone> like, <laughs> um, before he was an artist, he was a, a QA guy. And I'm sorry, uh, Gareth, if you're listening to this. Um, uh, and, you know, as lovely bloke he was in the world, he wasn't a great QA guy. So um, I was talking to whoever was his manager and, and probably um, the exec producer of, of RuneScape at the time. And they said, look, we've, we've got an option. He'll either go or you've got to take him as an artist. But if you take him as an artist, he's got to make it work. And uh, so I said, yeah, well, fuck it. We'll take him as an artist. Because, you know, when you're talking about people's lives, people's, careers you you want to help them out mm. and they went through an interview process and we sort of sat down i think it was me it was john it was ash um I don't know who else was with us. probably just us three um i was like yeah no he can he can do a job for us and so i worked with him over the next sort of three four years to make sure that the he really understood what being an artist for old school was to make sure that he was the best artist and he went through uh junior artist to artist to senior artist to lead artist, then he just went through that entire process and uh, just watch getting somebody into something they're passionate about, just to watch them flourish and become somebody so much more than they were just to, as a QA person um, is, is such a wonderful thing to watch. He's like, and, he, dr he dr uh, drove the whole, what I absolutely have so much love for with old school streams when they do them is the showcases that are absolutely incredible to watch. I remember um, running one of the streams where I would just sit, sit there and watch Mod Ghost while I was running the stream, just work away on Jagged or whatever it may be, and he would just do his magic. It was amazing. Mm. Um, Absolutely. I mean, you talk about the art streams they did. That was his idea. That wasn't a community manager's idea. That wasn't my idea. He came to me and he said, Matt, I want to do um, these these community streams where I'm going to just create a piece of content in front of them because I think we can make better content that way. And that was the key thing is like, if we make content with our players in our ears telling us what they think, we can make better content. And that was his thinking. And you think, if you've got a, a lead artist that's telling you this, I mean, 
how can you go wrong? You know, these these are people who are doing the most difficult thing for an artist, which is I am putting my heart into a, a piece of art and then I'm allowing you to rip it to pieces and tell me that I'm rubbish at what I'm doing just so I can make a better thing. That is such a difficult thing to do. There's so few people in the world who are able to 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 take that sort of feedback and and it really is destructive feedback at times to be able to know that the end result is going to be better if they do it and to be able to cope with that is such a such a such a powerful thing. I have such I'm an really ap- pleased that Gareth was was able to do that. I have such an appreciation, an appreciation. for the artists of old school who have to do an mm. art style that is not modern. It's so mm. unique to get right. So I yeah. absolutely love that. The way I explained it to Gareth was um, there's there's being an artist which is making a beautiful picture. Okay, you make something absolutely beautiful, but there's also being a commercial artist where you have to create something that is going to sell. And that's what his job is at Jagex. And we'll support him in uh, becoming a great artist as well, and we'll give him the opportunities to make great art um, alongside that. And we put time in so he could work on RuneScape uh, 3 as well. And actually use their proper gra- their full proper their full graphics engine with all the bells and whistles that it has to make some beautiful art. Um, but at the end of the day, you're a commercial artist. You're there to make a product that is going to uh, excite people. And he went into that and you know understood that it was a art skill in itself to be able to create art within the limitations of this art engine that he had, this graphics engine that he had, was 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 an art form in itself. And, and he took it to the next level. You look at you talk to the artists back in uh, 2005 to 2009. I've spoken to a few since, and they're absolutely amazed with what he's been able to deliver. Um, it's it's they they never dreamed that the art engine, the, the graphics engine they created to deliver uh, old school RuneScape was able to do what 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 it currently can do, and what Gareth has been able to do with it. It's yeah, amazing. Okay, um, shall we? Get on to your departure from Jagex. I mean, I don't work there anymore. No, you don't. When did you leave? Oh, well, fuck. I should stop going there every day then, shouldn't I? <laughs> I thought the restraining order was about. <laughs> um, when did you leave Jagex? Um, officially beginning of March. Uh, beginning, no, beginning of May, wasn't it, last yeah, year? Yeah, I think I've got May on my list here, yeah. Yeah, beginning of May. So I think I... My last day working there was probably February. February? Yeah, I think it's February, towards the end of February. Wow. Um, okay, so obviously I'm going to ask the obvious question. You can decide to answer this or not. Um, do you want to go into details of that, or do you just want to leave it at that? Um, I can't go into details. Fine. Um, I am forbidden to do so. But I think sort of overall... Um, I think back in 2018, uh, Jagex had changed a lot. Um, Jagex was continuing to change. There was a point where, I mean, I remember having a talk to my manager and uh, I was saying that six months ago I was running a game. I'm not anymore. And that that was a fundamental thing for me. It was a case where... um, where my job had changed so much that it was no longer what I was good at. And I've been pigeonholed into this area, which nobody actually really knew what it was. And it was a case of like, you know, can I do this thing, which, you know, nobody really understands what it is. Nobody knows what they want to do, what they want it to be. Um, They were bringing in uh, executive producers to run the game. And I didn't know why nobody was talking to me about that. So it was a case of, right, it was about time to, to, to go and do something else. Um, and that's 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 basically how it came about. I think you chat with my uh, manager and it's like, well, what's the point of me being here? And uh, that's 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 basically where it went. Okay. Um, I think it's a mistake on their part, uh, but I earn a lot more than I did back then, and um, I'm much happier than I was in the last two years. I think. I think sort of looking looking back at it, there was an awful lot of naivety about where the product was going to go and how it was going to get there. Um, the company got incredibly top heavy. 
uh, everybody had a different demand on what it should be and um, nobody seemed to, to care about what it was. And it's like, well, you know, let's, let's, let's move on and uh, let somebody else see if they can take it to the next step. I mean, the important thing to come out of that is that you're happier, right? That's the biggest thing, first of all. You seem, obviously, like, based on what people are saying in chat, you seem happier, and obviously that's a huge thing in its own right. Um, mm. So one of the things that I think um, is quite nice, um, I really wish my old manager would hear this, was uh, this week at work, uh, we did a kickoff for the year. And part of the kickoff uh, involves looking at the previous year. And they did a... Um, a vote across the entire company and said who's made the most impact in the company over the uh, last uh, 12 months and i came third i've only been at the company for five months uh, and i was like oh my god you know 10 percent of the entire company voted for me as making the biggest impact over the entire year and i've been there for five months and i was like oh my god and my previous manager of, uh, has had heard that i would quite happily say fuck you mate um <laughs> oh your face is a treat <laughs> But as, as he, oh, he doesn't work at he doesn't work at Jagex now, so um, yeah, let's, let's go. Um, no, it's uh, my my CEO. I was I was chatting to him the other day, and he said, you know, the reason I brought you into the company is because you've got this uh, this ability to empathise with people and to 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 really you know bring people along on a journey to make things happen. And also, you're a pretty good product manager too. And I was like, well, that's good then. <laughs> that, that's the, impo massive. the important thing is, is that you're pretty good at what you do. That's the good thing. <laughs> yeah. And for, for my, my, my CEO, he's, uh, he's, uh, that, that, that's high praise indeed. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, I was uh, quite, 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 quite pleased about that. Um, I do miss. Jagex every single day. Yeah, I was going to say like. Oh, do, no, do you no, miss... it's not true. I don't miss Jagex every single day. I miss old school. I miss the old school team. Um, oh. I miss. I miss uh, the people I worked with. I miss you. Um, I miss. I'm gonna make you cry again. Um, I miss so much of what I did at Jagex um, every single day. Uh, that's never going to change. You know. But, when I left, I, I didn't feel pleased with Jagex. Um, uh, but then I sort of look back beyond that and I think of the opportunities that I've had and the stuff that I've done, how I've grown as a person. If I look at the how I was before um, I got to old school and started the old school uh, uh, gig, um, the stuff I've learned from 2013, the stuff I've experienced, I mean, one of the key things, it's probably nothing to so many people, but the first TwitchCon, I went to a foreign country on my own. Oh, yes, I remember. Oh, my God. I remember you, uh, yeah. you mentioned about you going on, my, on your own. Oh, my Lord. I actually remember that so well. Yeah, and that's something I would never would ever have felt comfortable to do. But there's one thing I sort of learned. I was like, I mean, at that point, I was like, I have to go because this is such an opportunity that I can't say no. And after that, the one thing I learned from that was you've got to put yourself in a difficult situation. You've got to be able to do things that you find uncomfortable and move outside your comfort zone to be able to move forward. Because you know, things such as standing in front of 1,600 people at RuneFest and talking to them um, is something I would never have thought I'd ever be able to do. But you do it, and you, you just you just grow as a person through these opportunities. And I'd certainly learned through working on Old School and working at Jagex, if you say yes to do stuff. Um, I mentioned earlier about taking responsibility, but saying yes to do stuff. And grows you as a person and makes you better and bigger as a person. And that's such a such an amazing thing. I mean, how many people in the chat have stood in front of sixteen hundred people and had a conversation with them, and you know, presented stuff to them? And uh, you know, it's it's not not a huge amount of people that have done it. Um, and to most people, it will absolutely terrify them. But you do it once, and you know makes you feel a bit better you do it twice it makes you feel even more better and even comes to streaming sitting here talking to a camera talking to you as me myself rather than um you know a corporate face of jagex yeah uh is is something that i'm so comfortable with that i've uh, i think most people can see i'm comfortable with it now oh is, I, think, um, I, think, I think that comes across quite well yes yeah, so I, th I, th I think i had a bit of practice yeah uh, it's something that i would you know five six years ago i never thought i would be able to do and you know i'm such a 
it, it's just stuff that comes from working with a company where where Jagex, you know, Jagex allowed me to have those opportunities, and you know, I, I snapped them up and took hold of them and and made it happen. And that's 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 something that I would encourage anybody to be able to do. If you're uncomfortable doing something, say yes and then get it done, and then you will see how you grow as a person. Because if you stay in your own little world of yourself, you're never going to go outside that little world. Um, I mean, things. I mean, I wouldn't have the job now if I didn't have. Uh, uh, if I didn't do what I did for Jagex. Um, I mean, when I left Jagex, the amount of people, um, I changed my LinkedIn profile to looking for a job. I had contacts from 20 people in under a week wanting me wow. to go and work for them. Right? I had um, Square Enix, for example, wanting me to go on the re work on the remake of Final Fantasy VII. And you think, fuck, that's, that's pretty special. I had um, Wargaming get in touch. I had Minecraft get in touch. World of Warcraft never did, <laughs> as much as most people would love to think they did. They never did. Um, uh, every mobile company you could possibly imagine uh, got in touch. Um, Games Workshop didn't either, because I'd have snapped them up like a uh, no problem at all. I'd work for Games Workshop. Um, companies up in uh, Newcastle, up in uh, Nottingham, uh, all wanted me to go work for them. Um, so th there was a huge opportunity. And before I took uh, – this, this, is, this is the killer story – is before I took up this job. So I, I accepted this job, and I was about to start on Monday. On Friday, I get a call from Google saying, do you want to come work with us on DeepMind? And I'm like, yeah, as much as I'd love to, I've already you know, signed the contract with a new company, and you've got to do what's right. So um, wow. I'm working with this new company. So th the opportunities that I got from working at Jagex was was astounding. Um, and that's, that's something that, that comes from putting effort into a job, putting effort into um, uh, trying to do the best that you can and and making sure that, you know, you're you're always trying to push yourself further. And, you know, I wouldn't have got that if it wasn't for Jagex. There's, there's no way. As much as, you know, as, as frustrating as those last few months and years were, had all the cool stuff not happened before that, I would not be, I would not be where I am now. And even just talking to people who are still at Jagex and you know that bumping into them at uh, events because I still go to the same events that they do, there's still such this great feeling of, of, of support and camaraderie um, that goes on. It's 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 a great place, and you know, I, I, I sat here thinking about you know what we we're going to talk about today, and I thought that you know we could I could bitch until the cows come home and make things look really bad if I really wanted to, but that's not what I want people to get out of this. No, no, absolutely um, not. Jagex is a wonderful company, um, but in every company you get people who are dicks, which is always the case, and you've got to deal with that. Um, mistakes happen, which is always the case. Um, but if you have the opportunity to work for Jagex, you should, because what they can bring you um, is is such a great, great thing. Um, and they've got, they've if got, you put the effort in, they've actually yeah. gotten so much better as well over the years. Like they absolutely yeah. have. Like from Absolutely. someone like I, I joined on like the most minimal temporary contract ever, and mm. you know people like yourself saw something in me, and I was able to grow as a person from that, and I'm forever grateful for that. So you know, I'm like I wouldn't be where I am without Jagex. That's a fact. Like it's helped me immensely. I've met some really amazing people who I consider close friends. I've had the opportunity to like live a really lovely life, and you know I'm forever grateful mm. for that. It's you know it's something I I love for that. Um, I'm gonna. I mean I've got more questions to ask, and uh, I feel like as we get towards the end of the streams, uh, the juicier questions start to come up now. So, uh, you ready for this one? You mean we haven't had much juice already? Well, I mean I think we have, but I think uh, I think I have I have to ask this question, otherwise people are gonna ask it anyway. In your time at Jagex and on Old School, was there any internal pressure to try and monetize Old School? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. There wouldn't be a company if it, there wasn't. So there have been some bad decisions made. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's sort of rewind a bit. Um, a company has to make money. Right? Yes. A company has to look at um, how it can maximize the money it comes. That's just basically it. You forget about the products that it creates. If a company doesn't make money, company goes bust. Simple as that. 
Um, a company that makes less money this year than it did last year is going to go bust. A company always has to be growing. Um, if the company continues growing, then cool stuff will happen, positive stuff will happen. If it shrinks, then that's really, really bad. Um, that's when you know the, the business people come in and they just plow down for profit. Um, that's that's not what we want to be with there. So the company has been growing year on year on year, and I think there was a news post I saw this year or a, a, uh, this week or last week where they're talking about 2019 was the most successful year ha uh, they've ever had, which you know I completely understand. Um, so which means pressure for MTX has gone into gone to old school. Absolutely was going to happen. Um, I've had conversations with people who have demanded that it goes in. I've had conversations with people who um, have said, if it doesn't go in, the company's going to go bust. I've had you know, multiple conversations on that thing where huge pressure has been put in to make it happen. But one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of really proud about is um, no matter what pressure comes down to me, if I go down to the team and say, right, or I went down to the team and said, right, we're putting in MTX, those guys would push back on me. And the real difficult thing as, as a product manager within a company is you have to balance above and below. And you get it wrong 99% of the time. You can't get it right, especially with these sort of subjects. It's, it's difficult. Um, I spent, before I left, I spent sort of the last three months doing an investigation into um, uh, MTX. Uh, we did uh, lots of customer interviews, uh, focus groups, to try and understand what we're doing. And we came out with a clear opinion that the only time that MTX should go into game is if the game is going to die, and we're sure of it. Um, and I basically did that for the for the understanding that this game is a growth game. This game is going to remain a growth game. It's going to continue growing uh, from a revenue point of view if we do the right things so that we had the evidence to say that, that no matter what you say, this is what we believe and this is why. This is the evidence to say that you should not put MTX into old school. And if you do... Cosmetics, nothing else. That is the worst thing. That that is the worst thing that can happen. And when that went out, it basically came back as we're not going to do it at all whatsoever. None of this is going to happen. And that's like great. When you've got the CEO, you've got your executive producer, um, you've got everybody else at the top level saying we're not going to MTX old school. Then that's not going to happen. Um, so yeah. So okay. that that yeah. that's. There, there were multiple things that came back on how we could how we could revenue it differently. Um, none of them have happened, not one. Um, the only thing that has got into game, bonds, right? um, which I'm surprised no one's mentioned, are bonds. Yes. Um, and I remember sitting down. One of the biggest live streams I ever had to do was to do the free to play pitch to the players, and that was a case of you know this was a. Uh, a make or break live stream. This was an hour with me in front of a camera trying to convince our players to say yes, we could uh, we could make the game work. And I was completely honest in everything that I said, which is we can make the game free to play, but we know what will happen if we just make it free to play. We need bonds to continue make the game working successfully, and that proved to be true. So I was I was, I was pleased that got through the poll because I think if that hadn't have gone through. Um, the game probably wouldn't even exist now. Without bonds, the game just would not be would not exist. Wow. Um, because bonds is what kept so many people into the game, so many people uh, continually playing the game. Um, and yeah, there's been so much pressure from so many of the people I mentioned earlier that the company got incredibly top heavy with leadership. But and the people that were coming in were asking the right questions from their point of view. You'd have a director of marketing come in that would say, right. I have done this in other games and it has made us millions and millions of pounds. You know, we've put, we've sold this, that, and the other. We sold XP in lots of other games. It's made us, you know, 100 million pounds a week. And it's like, that's great. Well done. But our game's different. If we were to do that in game, we'd lose 100 million pounds a week. Not that we make that amount of money, but, you know, um, because the whole structure of the game is very different. And they come in, they ask the right questions from their point of view. And it was up to the, the old school team, uh, me and, um, you know, the other people in the team to be able to say, no, no, this is different because of these reasons. The reason this game exists is because of that. Therefore, you know, you, we, we shouldn't be doing that. And uh, that's that's worked. I've had no end of those conversations, but they're not bad conversations to have. 
if we weren't having those conversations or we never had those conversations, I'd be really worried because that would mean that the conversations were not coming down to the team. But as long as the team are involved in those conversations, then that's 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 how it works. The biggest thing for me I've always uh, realized is when someone comes to Jagex and when they work on RuneScape or old school, either one, it is so different from your normal game in the games industry and its community is very different and mm. that is the thing you have to realize. Like, the community significance in RuneScape as a brand is so mm. different versus mm, any other game really. in the industry and that's something that I think people initially fail to get when they yeah. uh, work to ja work for Jagex, because it's a very unique thing. It's very different. Um, like the community can be um, a ball lake. Of course they can. Like there's been many a times on both games where we've seen it, where like trying to like get into like trying to fix something or trying to take the lead on an issue, and it's just constant negativity. It can be horrendous, like to deal with. Like I'm sh like let's let's look at the Pride event for old school. That must be an example, right? That was fucking horrific, that was. I mean, the, the amount of hate that came out of that. I mean, what's wrong with a gay person saying, I want to celebrate gay people? If there's one person that would stand up in front of me as a person and say that is wrong, then I, I can't believe that's the case. You know, that is that is fundamentally wrong. I know that, and it, I mean, I guess it's a cultural thing as well. In the UK, we're very tolerant of, um, opening up and being um, accepting anything and everything. There's a lot of political issues in America that, that surround it. But then fundamentally for me, and I make no apologies for it, my, my belief as a person is that we are all equal, we are all the same, and we should all love each other. And that's the most important thing to me. And if there is a reason to go out and hate against anyone for, for anything which isn't you know, a substantial reason... Just because you prefer, you're a man and you prefer men, or you're a woman and you prefer women, you know, I'm sorry, that's not important. You know, there's so much more important things in the world to, to argue about than that. Let's, let's, let's get climate change sorted out mm. rather than worry about whether we fancy men or women. I mean, it's, it's such a, I don't know, it's just so frustrating for me. And I mean, this, this brings up a really good point is the pressure of the internet is absolutely huge. Um, Wolf during that time, um, he must have felt uh, because he would have got the brunt of tens of thousands of people targeting him. And as much as many people would like to say, you know, just ignore it, it'll go away. It's like, well, yeah, it does go away, but you can't ignore it. I um, um, I don't know if he's fine with me saying this, but um, I saw him break down, like, because of it. I literally... I like, watched him break down because of the escalation of how much it kicked off. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me saying it, but like I, I on the time it happened, and I remember it so well. It's just like I remember literally like watching him because when you're so invested in something, he's constantly refreshing because you because you're just gonna constantly keep refreshing to see the comments. Yeah, you can just yeah. see his. Um, um, stance and his body language is just telling an entire story it's horrendous like just watching it it's just like yikes like it's not good yeah absolutely i mean i remember during that i was i was passing his desk three times a day asking if he was all right just to make sure that he knew there were people backing him up yeah and that, that we were here for him but you just can't get away from that when you've got tens of thousands of people shouting at you and and for the for the pride thing the people who were shouting weren't runescape players we did a big, deep investigation into the people who were doing this stuff. They were anti-gay hate groups that had targeted the game. This was not this was not the RuneScape players doing it. There were people who knew what RuneScape was and got uh, anti-hate, anti-homophobic um, uh, groups, hate groups into the game to go and do this stuff. And wow. it was like, what the hell are you guys playing at? Um, and that mind, that is 100% wrong. And I, I sat in front of the press and said, you know, this is absolutely wrong. If our players think this is wrong, then our players are wrong. But it was never our players. These were these were hate groups that, that targeted the game because of this. Um, and that that to me is is so very wrong. But it's not just it's not just homophobia that the the sexism that happens as well was was huge. And I've dealt with that multiple times. The one thing that I've always believed is you know gender equality is such an important thing. Um, and 
you know, I, I've been out there and publicly supported uh, female streamers in particular because they have such a tough time dealing with how the community works. Um, and, you know, for for most people who doubt me, you know, I'm able to think with something other than my penis. Um, I have a brain and I can think about the bigger issues here and not not want to jump into bed with, you know, every streamer I, I talk to. Um, and it's, you know, how could people not want to 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 realize that the female streamers in the community are as important as the male ones it's not something that just happens just in the community it happens throughout the industry as well and just watching females in the gaming industry is just just so underrepresented that it needs to needs needs to sort itself out quite frankly and i've seen instances of such um sexism and uh, you know wrongness that have happened across the industry that you know these things are still prevalent um, and we need to need need to sort it out as a as a, as a society. Bigger issues than RuneScape. Mm, agreed. Um, okay. Well, we've been streaming for three hours plus. Three, yeah, three and a, three hours plus. Um, I'm gonna ask. I think I'm gonna get ready to wrap up and ask you a pretty important question. Um, excuse me to wrap this up. And where and in, in in essence, this question is about as simple as it gets. Where do you see old school? In a year's time and five years' time. Uh, in a year's time, I see it in pretty much the same place. I don't see too much changed. Um, one of the things that worried me quite a lot in the last few weeks that I noticed was um, uh, I got a notification on my phone about the old school app. Now, to most people, that means absolutely nothing. Um, but the notification system is something that wanted to go into game from the day we launched mobile, which was... November last year? November, November 2018. 2018. Yes, yeah, November 2018. So it's taken 14 months to get that into game. 13 months, 14 months. Long, over a year to get that into uh, into being a thing. Um, so does that mean that we spent that amount of time with the engine team working on making that happen and not doing other stuff? Um, and that, that, that worries me a bit. I, is, is RuneScape focusing on the commercial side of things, which is you know absolutely fine from a business point of view. Um, but equally, they're sacrificing things such as uh, game uh, engine support for the clan system or for for um, uh, group Iron Man. Is that being sacrificed? I hope it's not. I hope they're doing both alongside each other. Um, but that, that that worries me a little bit. And the industry as a whole is heading more towards data driven um, money making. So. When I left Jagex, a lot of uh, mobile gaming companies wanted to talk to me. And I always said, no, I'm not going to talk to a gaming uh, mobile gaming company because you don't make real games. I want to make games that people find exciting or allow games to make play uh, people play that, that, that are really exciting to play. Most mobile games are, right, okay, we'll, we'll have a money-making system, we'll build a game on top of it, and then we'll optimise that game to get as much money out of people. And that, to me, is not a game at all. That is a... That is that is a you know a, a way of making money. I and just that's what I just want to take this opportunity to say that the, the stream is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, by the way. So uh, just a quick heads up for you all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, I I completely agree with you, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I worry that RuneScape will go down that route of just optimizing, 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 optimizing um, to to make more money. In which case, you're not going to get any cool content. Okay, and then five years. Five years, I don't think it's going to change much. I think it's going to shrink now. I don't. I think really? It's peaked. Yeah, I think it peaked um, earlier last year, just before I left. Um, Why then? Like, like, are you saying that joking, or are you genuinely like? Do you genuinely I've been, I've been watching the numbers um, because if you go to there's a website called Misplaced Items, the uh, concurrent uh, users chat. Thing. Yeah, yeah, and just watching that and how that is going down, and nothing seems to be making it go up. Um, uh, along with the the knowledge that, um, or along with the belief that there's going to be no game-changing updates in the next five years, as in there's, there's nothing that's going to sort of take it a step up. It's going to be very similar sort of updates. It's going to be PVM updates. It's going to be um, uh, latest quest updates. There's going to be no big game changes that happen in the next five years. I don't see how it will... We'll Do you honestly up. believe you won't see a new skill in five years? No. 
All Absolutely right. not. I think we think we're done with that, which is really upsetting. I think the only thing that's going to make it go up is a significant. I don't know what it would be, but a game changer update, and I don't see that happening. I don't think Jagex or the community are in the right place for it. All right. Um, and then apart from that, I mean, if there's anything you want to cover, by all means, but uh, my brain is absolutely fried. Um, we have <laughs> talked, I've been like honestly fucking mind blown by some of the stuff that's come out of this stream. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, just looking at my list, I pretty much covered everything I've wanted to cover. Um, nice. And we've obviously covered it here and then everywhere. So if you see anything in the chat, then I guess. Um, Jewel Arena, I know that we were talking about earlier, weren't we? Did we talk about Jewel Arena? Yeah, before we even started. Oh, talking. yeah, yeah, we before talked we about it. Yeah, 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 we were I talking remember. about Jewel Arena. Yep, you're right. And, um, and uh, there's, there's the problem with the Jewel Arena is we don't, ent I mean, what I did before I left is I started an investigation into the Jewel Arena to see what happened. Now, I ran a, a one which was um, a sort of very high level one uh, a few years before, and that showed that only 5% of people who use the Jewel Arena. Um, we're actually breaking rules. So it was a really low level of it, in which case, you know, when that came back, I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to look further into it. But over the years past, um, over the next couple of years, I saw more and more um, concern about the Jewel Arena and about the stories of people saying how they got into debt because of the Jewel Arena. Um, and you even see the live streams now about it where people are getting into debt by uh, going through the Jewel Arena. Um, and so before I left, I started. I asked for an investigation to be run to to understand what would happen if we removed the dual arena. Um, then I left, and it hadn't progressed. But I understand that that's being looked at right now as well. Um, so what would happen if you removed the dual arena? Okay, so there's, there's multiple things that could happen. There could be a whole load of really positive, good players that really enjoy the dual arena, get really annoyed, and leave the game. That's a bad thing. Um, it could that the high-profile people who have a lot of debt and uh, um, maximize that uh, publicity, let's say, um, leave the game. Uh, it could be that all the cheaters leave the game because they're all moving stuff through uh, the dual arena. But the, the, the honest answer is we don't know, or I don't know. Back then, I didn't know what the answer of those three were, and we needed to understand that. If 95% of the people who use the dual arena are engaging with it properly, um, in a real uh, uh, positive way, then why get rid of it? Let's just help that 5%. Let's look at it and if there's people getting in debt um, who are you know, spending real money to, uh, to sort out the dual arena, let's help those people out. Um, if there are people who are live streaming it, let's stop them live streaming it and, and showing the bad side of the dual arena. But um, I think the key thing that needs to happen is, it's, is it needs to be understood what is happening in the dual arena. And that needs to be understood in the context of what's happening in PvP as well. So we spoke earlier about having a full PvP plan on where to go with PvP, what to do with it. I think the dual arena certainly fits within that. Um, I'm a great believer in um, having the dueling anywhere thing you used to have back in Classic. So oh, I thought that was... We have it in, I mean, it's in RuneScape. Like, duel anywhere. You cool. can just right-click duel at someone anywhere you want to. Cool. Uh, so. I'd, I'd love to have that sort of thing. Um, but... There needs to be a complete understanding of how it works in the context of everything else, especially in the context within PvP. Um, but quite frankly, right now, the community is saying an awful lot of stuff because they're exposed to the most negative parts because they're the ones that um, is what drives to the top of the community awareness. Um, but like I said, there could be 95% is absolutely fine, in which case let's sort out that 5% and let's allow players to play the game they want to play it. Um, but that's a, that's a problem for... Uh, uh, for Jagex these days, not me anymore. Cool. Uh, do you see anything else you want to talk about? Uh, we got, I don't know, has the chat got any questions that we haven't covered? Yeah, ask away, guys. Oh, OSHD. Um, okay, yeah, so that's an interesting one. Oh, actually, and third party clients we may as well talk about as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's talk about those. Um, so, OSHD, Mod Warden, I don't know Mod Warden, so I can't really, I, I don't know for him, so I can't really sort of say anything about him. Um, it's his, his job is to run the game, and I'm sure he will do it absolutely fine. Uh, uh, Mod Rogan Esports, I think um, support isn't there to make it happen. One of the discussions I had before I left was, um, is it fair to bring somebody into a role for esports when there isn't an esport, which is why we should have kept Deadman Mode going, but um, 
that didn't happen. Um, anyway, HD. So, uh, so there's two ways of doing HD graphics for old school. You can have a technological uh, solution which will change all the existing graphics into HD graphics, or you can rework all the existing graphics into HD graphics. The first one is um, uh, probably the quickest way to do it, but probably the most difficult to get right. The second one, the last time we did that uh, with Dreamscape, took 12 months and a whole team of artists, and then a further 12 months to actually correct all the mistakes that were made. And we outsource and did everything else. There's a huge amount of manpower into the second one. So the second one's probably going to be unrealistic. Uh, and now you want to toggle as well, so you want both to happen at the same time. So that's what makes it even twice as difficult. So the first one's a technological um, solution for it. So um, a piece of technology which takes existing graphics, turns them into HD graphics, and then presents them back to the players so they're in a, a reasonable way. Uh, there's been multiple people who have attempted to do it. Um, I remember there's uh, one chap we actually brought up from New Zealand uh, to go and have a look at his technology. And within an hour of looking at his technology, we knew that it was you know, never going to work. Um, most OS HD clients have the RuneScape client running and then have another game engine running on top of that or graphics engine running on top of that. Um, the problem you've got with that is it takes a huge amount of um, uh, processing power to make it work, which means, you know, unless you've got a high-end computer, you're not going to run it. Secondly, the way they do it is just so poor that you can't release it as a commercial game. So imagine um, imagine you've got a, uh, I don't know, a, a, uh, a tabard on top of a piece of armor. So a piece of uh, cloth that sits on top of a piece of armor. Now you've got the piece of cloth that sits here, and you've got the armor that sits underneath it. Now, a graphics engine should look at it and go, that's a tabard, that sits on top, there's the armor, that sits underneath. Easy peasy. The problem is, with the way that uh, old school RuneScape's made, is that what tells a graphics card that this is on top and this is behind doesn't exist. Therefore, what you get is the graphics card will look at it and go, uh, I'm not entirely sure where they want to be, so we're just going to make it do this, because that seems the right thing to do. So you get all this fighting between the two levels, and it just looks really horrible and nasty. And when you have a look at the OSD, uh, OS, uh, OSHD clients, you actually dig into the detail of it, of what you see every day. You see that all over the place. And it looks absolutely atrocious. Um, and as a, I mean, it's great for a guy working in his basement to make. Yeah, beautiful. Um, but as a commercial client, you just can't do that. It's a commercial game. You try and release something. Yeah, said buffering, exactly, uh, Scuffle. Um, if you, you try and release that as a commercial client, you'll just, you just can't do it. it you will lose money. It will be absolutely disastrous. Um, what I yeah. don't understand is, like, I may be completely ignorant to this, but if people want HD, isn't that like why RuneScape is a thing compared to old school? I always look at old school's unique graphic style in that, and I don't ever see why it ever needs to go HD, but maybe I'm a bit ignorant to it. I don't know. That's just my two cents. Oh, yeah, the, 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 you got to look at what why people play old school. Do people play old school because the graphics are shit? I think ninety percent of ninety nine point nine percent of people say no. And um, people play. There's there's one fundamental reason why people play old school, and that's the OC. Some people talk about MTX, but to be fair, if MTX were to go into old school, how many people would actually leave? If the OC was to go into old school, everybody would leave. I think the the core reason why people play old school is the OC. And if the graphics were better, I don't think people would honestly care that much. Fair. Um, but it's the effort to do it and the value from it. I think if we were to spend 12, or Jaggets would spend 12 months working on it with a team of developers and made it perfect first time around, I don't think they'd see any benefit from it. Okay. So why would they do it? So uh, I guess um, the final one we can go on to wrap it up uh, would be third-party clients. So how did that all come about? Oh yeah, so that was that was our uh, our mate um our mate what's his face Jack Mob James Jack Mob yeah that's it our mate Jack Mob um who created Orion it was first called wasn't it um, but he was very friendly with the CEO of company Mark Gerhard uh, and uh, got permission to uh, make it um and then. 
so he made it and he worked with it and uh you know it was going all right when we were we were early on it was it was a great benefit to old school having it i think um having uh ryan and os buddy working properly uh working together and then jack mob left after mark gerhard left um and that's when it got difficult he set up his own company under the tutelage of mark gerhard i think there was some emotional um feelings between um mark and jagex when he left um which i think made the communication difficult um i have multiple conversations with uh james about our buddy and how we can make it work and it was always really congenial and really understanding when we wanted to do something when we wanted to change something never had a problem with that at all um and then i think once we realized we needed to do anything, I think paralysis within Jagex sort of set in and we couldn't decide what we wanted to do or how we wanted to do it. Um, and uh, that that just stopped the right actions from being taken. And by the time we got into position, it was like, right, we definitely have to do something. We're so far, be Jagex was so far behind the ability to actually combat these things. When it comes to, for example, if you want to combat it by making your own client, these guys have been working on their clients for three, four years. You know, that's not something that could suddenly be created out of nothing. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, it became difficult to deal with. And uh, I believe there's a strategy for it. I knew the strategy before I left that I can't actually talk about. Um, but I've not seen any action. Um, or any results of this strategy being uh, implemented. So I don't know what's going to happen. All right. Um, okay. I think uh, the best way I think we can wrap this up is, I guess, maybe in case people aren't aware, because some people seem to be surprised that you're an ex mod. So obviously, people have still haven't figured that one out. So, I mean, how, how can I keep in touch with you after this? How can you what? Sorry? How can I keep in touch with you after this? Well, I shall give you my phone number. It is 017. <laughs> oh, I actually thought you were going to. <laughs> no, of course I wasn't. Um, I'm still on tw on uh, Twitter um, uh, at real Matt K because Donald Trump. Um, why not? Um, he's at real Donald Trump. <laughs> then I realised I did this and I was like, oh fuck, it's the same as Donald Trump. Now it looks like I'm copying him. Um, uh, I'm also on on Twitch as well at uh, Kemplos uh, K E M P L O S. Um, I think that's about it. Okay. okay. I mean, okay. what more do we need to say, right? This has been three and a half hours of us essentially talking. I mean, you talking mostly, but us talking about a lot of stuff and a lot of crazy stuff. But I think on a personal, I just want to say, you know, even though I didn't get to work with you that much on a professional level, I mean, your impact is very much obviously obvious in what it did and what you did, sorry, for old school. So, uh, you know, we had uh, a great time in LA for the time we went there. Mm, yeah, I, I consider you a really good friend. My wife, like, you know, you and my wife got on really well as well. Like, you know, yeah. So thank you for well, obviously taking the time to just talk about all of this. It's been awesome. And, uh, you know, hopefully everyone's enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I've, 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 I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I've, I'm glad to get a few things off my chest, which is, which is quite <laughs> nice. To get a, few, a few things into the open. I mean, uh, I suppose, you know, out of all of this, there. I mean, we spoke about this beforehand. Actually, you know, I think that's when you went offline when you had to update your uh, video drivers. Yeah, yeah. I said, Everyone's expecting a smoking gun, and there isn't one. There is, there is no smoking gun. It's just the way the world works. Um, Jagex people is a people great want the place. drama. They want the popcorn. Absolutely. You know, Jagex is a great place. Um, mm -hmm. RuneScape is a great game. It's been so much to so many of us. You know, everybody here watching has has, has had their hearts touched by RuneScape. And you shouldn't forget that. This is, you know, whatever happens in the future, um, we're in a, you know, we, we, we've all lived the same thing together. And we, it's, it's, that's what's so important. You know, the amount of people who've touched RuneScape, what, quarter of a billion people have been involved in RuneScape over the years? That's, that's something special. So There's a reason why, well, as a brand, it's about to hit 20 years, right? So, yeah, know, absolutely. I mean, yeah. It's, it's flying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's pretty insane. And, you know, I just want to say it's been, like, just awesome to be a part of this. I don't know. I, I'm, I, 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 I'm glad people enjoy this stuff because I love it from a, an insight and fascinating perspective. So, yeah, it's been 
an absolute blast to do this. Um, for those of you who are interested, who want to follow my channel and keep in touch, I try to do these somewhat frequently. And uh, the next one uh, is next Saturday with um, someone called Mod Ramen from RuneScape Free, who is a con oh. uh, who is a content developer. We have part two of that. We're going to talk about some of the stuff he's made and uh, a bit more personal stuff as well. So uh, yeah, it's been I, 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 have, I have some dramatic questions I can get you to ask about him. <laughs> Pop them in. Pop them, pop them to me. I can ask. There's, there's, there's a room, there's a room fest story, um, where uh, we're leaving RuneScape and uh, he's kissing some random girl on the way as we re leave, uh, leave um, RuneFest. Um, I can't remember what year that was. That was what 2015. It might have been 2014. Do you not know about this? Oh man! <laughs> Does it look like I know about this? <laughs> it's a free question for him. Oh my god! <laughs> I think we walked past him saying, "Don't touch him. He's got um, he's got cooties or something." Oh my god! Yeah, it could have been his girlfriend for all I knew. I don't know. Oh dear! <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Uh, his lips, lips, lips attached to somebody, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she may have been able to tell by my reaction. Oh dear! I think all that. Uh, what, what, what a better way to end the stream. Um, but no, in all seriousness, <laughs> like you know, um, it's going to be interesting to see everyone's thoughts and comments on this. And for those of you who are watching and you may have joined late, um, I'm going to export this to YouTube and just leave it up there the entire stream. So feel free to. Uh, go for it and uh so on uh i am actually and um, maz is in the chat i did speak to maz earlier i am gonna look to see if i can speak to maz at some point um in the near future as well uh so that should be good fun to hear about maz's story obviously maz being the company longer than you matt which is a very mm -hmm. rare which is a rarity mm -hmm. for obviously your uh your tenure at jagex for someone to be there longer so uh yeah it'd be awesome to uh, talk to maz as well so i don't have a date for that but the next one will be mod ramen and matt thank you so much it it was a blast. It's a pleasure, mate. It's an absolute pleasure. Oh, goodness. Have yourself a wonderful night, guys, and I hope <laughs> you enjoyed it. So, bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>